Good afternoon and a big welcome to all attendees to this webinar. The webinar is entitled Providing Flexible Power Generation and Meeting the Needs of Industrial Gas Users in South Africa from mid-2026. My name is Chris Yelland, and I'm the Managing Director at EE Business Intelligence, and I'll be your host at this webinar, signed in from Johannesburg. A big welcome also to our presenters today, who will be introduced to you in due course. I'm also sharing a link with you now in the Zoom chat facility, where you can download presenter biographies. So go onto the chat facility, you'll see a link, uh, click on the link and you can download the, the bios. A big welcome to you also the attendees for your interest and participation today. This webinar is hosted by EE Business Intelligence. I would, however, like to acknowledge and thank the Industrial Gas Users Association of South Africa, Gigajoule, Romco, Quandi Gas, Spring Lights and Gas, and Dynamic Energy Consultants, and the South African IPP Association for their most valued support and participation in this webinar, and also for the great work that they do in this field. There are about 1,300 delegates registered to attend this webinar today to hear what the presenters have to say on the subject. This attests to the relevance of the subject matter being covered, as well as to the stature of the presenters. May I express a big thanks to all the presenters for their participation and for the time and effort they've put in. Please do note that this webinar is being recorded and links to view the webinar on demand and to download the presentations will be made available shortly to all those who have registered to attend, as well as publicly. While the presentation is in progress, please do send us your questions on the Q&A text facility and not on the chat facility on Zoom. You may also put up your hands to ask questions verbally and we will try and get to you. We've set aside about 30 minutes after the presentations for our expert presenters to answer just some of your questions. Colleagues, industrial gas users in South Africa are facing a gas supply cliff. After Sassel advised that it will cease the supply of gas via the Romco pipeline to traders and industrial users in June 2026, as it seeks to maximize the tail end of the gas supply from the Pande and Tamani gas fields in southern Mozambique for its own use. At the same time, driven by economic security of supply and decarbonization imperatives, South Africa is ramping up generation of variable renewable energy from the residential, commercial, industrial, mining, agricultural, municipal, and IPP sectors through public procurements and distributing distributed, embedded, and self-generation, and wheeling and trading of electricity. So fast and innovative solutions are required to address the impacts of these simultaneous challenges through new gas and flexible electricity supply projects. This webinar will explore the opportunities, the technologies, the economics, and the financing options, and give some examples as to how new gas supply projects and power generation plants could provide the solutions. The program for the day has been widely circulated, but a link to download the program will now be shared again here on the Zoom chat facility. So please take a look at the Zoom chat and download the program. Colleagues, the Minister of Electricity, uh, Minister Ramakhopa, was going to provide the opening address this afternoon, but unfortunately, he will be in Parliament today, dealing with questions arising from the President's State of the Nation address last week. So instead, Silas Zimu, the Special Advisor to the Minister of Electricity, has been delegated to speak and say a few words on behalf of the Minister, and also to give a few insights of his own on the subject at hand. I think Silas is well known to most of us here. He is an electrical engineer himself, and he has held various senior positions at ESCOM. Then he was the managing director at City Power Johannesburg, and then he was the electricity advisor to the former president of South Africa. 
and now he is the special advisor to the Minister of Electricity. So without further ado, I will now hand over to Silas Zimu for his opening address. Over to you, Silas. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, for the first time, let me call you Mr. Yellen. Um, and, and welcome to everybody that is joining. I see the numbers are increasing. The interest is high. Uh, firstly, let me thank the EE publishers for the good work that you continue doing in ensuring that uh, stakeholder engagements continue. These are not uh, uh, easy discussions. They happen at the wrong time when you're going through tough times on the energy availability, energy affordability, energy sustainability. I think the world has accepted that uh, everybody has to go the green route, low carbon emissions. And South Africa, as a signatory to, to Paris Agreement, we speak into that. So we've got no way of, of returning to anywhere. Um, but as we were excited about the, the just energy transition, looking into moving from high uh, carbon to low carbon, gas became the game changer. But disappointingly to us, then came the news from Sasol that uh, they won the supply and gas to major, major uh, industries. That, that came as a disturbance to us. Um, and we did engage uh, Sasol with the minister to say you know, what, what could have happened. Now, the country as a, as a whole, we, we know we're getting different news. There's gas in Bumalara, there's gas on the Mosul Bay side. But we're hearing more good news from our neighboring states, I think the latest one being Namibia. But, uh, you know, we need now these things to be put down, let the corporations decide. A lot is coming out of Mozambique, but as it comes out of Mozambique, we did expect that Mozambique could be a game changer for, for Sadek. But uh, it, it is important that uh, it, it starts to show some firmness that it can help. There's a huge opportunity on the ESCOM side with the, the packers of the power generators being positioned, stationed in uh, Bumalanga. And uh, Mozambique uh, should, should actually be a key supply to, to, to those if come the time of, of repurposing. There's good players that are around our neighboring states. Some are even South Africans who are looking into how to help with the gas to power. And, and we are encouraging that to continue. We have seen the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy issuing a gas to power a program. Richards Bay, uh, Saldana Bay, uh, Kuha, uh, and, 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 and we believe that you know, there's still a big role for gas to play in our, in our, in our industry. The unfortunate part is that uh, with all the, the challenges of the high demand, if gas was available, uh, Chris, it was not only to be meant for, for industry, big industry, also for, for, for residential, you know, cooking and heating, gas would have helped. Parts of Jobek are on, 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 on gas, and a lot of those customers, when you talk to them, they are happy. Uh, a lot of them, uh, they're able to keep their houses, homes warm, they're able to cook, and everybody with the new developments on the residential, and the commercial side are actually putting gas for even water heating. So we need the gas. We need it desperately. I think uh, as government, we're engaging uh, the DMRE to say probably the country has to have a, a gas role leader. You know, we've got Central Energy Fund, we've got uh, uh, Petrus A, we've got a few SOEs that could be used for that. And, and, and it's time that they, they stand up and take the lead. It can't always be left with industry. The sad thing is, it's the same us that had said to industry, convert from gas to electricity. It's the same us that are now saying, go back to gas. And all of a sudden, gas is a challenge on the, on the availability. We are still confident that uh, it, it is uh, part of our, our uh, just energy transition. It sits in the middle of moving us from where we are, where we are polluting, and to get us to be cleaner. 
So guess is the only one that, that has to come in. Interesting submissions have been put on our table uh, from experienced uh, uh, international players. Uh, and, and, and to us, uh, the main thing is protecting the, the social side of South Africa, especially the residential on the tariffing side. That, that issue of tariffing is going to haunt us for some time. Politically, until the elections, we're not going to avoid be able to avoid it. But it, it, it's something that uh, I see as, a, as, a, as something that we may have to even come up with what could be a special cross a subsidy for, for to be able to allow gas to, to come into play. Um, it is it is a very, very uh, important. We know we've got 18 million people who are on social grants. It's unsustainable. The constitution demands that we must give them access to energy, and, and we've not done well on that. We are lucky that you know nobody has taken us against the constitution to court to say we're not supplying what the constitution or doing what the, the constitution says we must do. If it was in America, I'm sure we would be in courts every day. So we've got a resilient community that knows that uh, solutions are there, they just need to be implemented. It can't be government alone. We, we have tried our parts, we have allowed for policy. So private sector has to come in as well. And where I see gas moving, is that don't wait for policies and all of that. Just be like the telecoms industry. They came in, Vodacom, CLC, MTN, and policy followed. And today, everybody has got a cell phone in, the, in their pockets. So uh, I would encourage that those that have got solutions, put them uh, forward. Don't, don't keep them to yourselves. Yes, some of the meetings that we have with you are very robust. Uh, they may not be comfortable, but uh, they are important. They are still very, very important. Um, a lot of the players want to sell molecules, and the country hasn't got a formula on how to get the molecules. Maybe uh, it's a wrong department if you look at the electricity. We're looking for energy. So partnering with those that can produce energy and those that can produce molecules is very, very important. And it's very key that you talk to one another and come to us as having spoken on how this can be done. Then the issue of PPAs, leave it to us. The issue of guarantees, leave it to us. We've had a, a, a national treasury say they're not going to give as for many money, any guarantees. So it's now in the private sector hands to help the country. What a beautiful country do we have. I'm sure all of you don't want to see us shutting down South Africa and moving somewhere else, where are we going to move to? Everybody's coming down here. So we need to save our economy. We need to save our population. We need to save the beauty of this country. We need to come out of this thing of load shedding. We need to separate and come up with policies that say, this is how we're going to build houses. Everybody must have access to gas. Industry has to play its role, keep the jobs going, those jobs are important. Those jobs are the ones that keep our economy going. So webinars like this are very, very, very key to us. And hence the minister said, don't even listen to me when I answer in parliament. Just ensure that we do what we had promised uh, uh, Chris. When Chris invited us, the dates of SONA were not yet confirmed. The people, the ministers that were going to respond and protect the state president uh, SONA were not yet uh, decided. And those names were decided uh, two days ago. And as they were decided, our minister's name was, I think he follows the minister of the MRE in response, which uh, then made him not to be available. But uh, typically him, he didn't want to say we're not available. He said, uh, Silas, go in there. The players know you. Uh, the players have got confidence in us. And let's get this thing going. So again, Chris, I'm going to say thank you for, for, for arranging this. I see some of the players that uh, have, have joined are uh, very, very key players, experienced players. Uh, and, 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 and we really appreciate all the efforts. We are still open, as you all know, to meet everybody when our diaries allow. As we meet you, we're also learning from what you guys are saying. So when you leave and we're not giving an answer, don't assume that we're saying no. 
because you still have to sleep over it and consult other departments like uh, environment, um, uh, energy, treasury. Uh, and, and we are, as government, starting to work closer um, as, as a unit, and as we've seen in many, many programs that are in place. So yes, like the president has always said, let's partner with the private sector, the experiences in the private sector, the power of policies in the public sector, and together we'll make the country a country that we all want to live in forever. Thank you, Chris. Well, thank you, uh, Silas, uh, for those words uh, and for the encouragement that you are giving us. And um, I, I want to just assure you that we understand fully uh, that the minister's first responsibility is to parliament. And uh, we appreciate uh, the fact that he has delegated this to you and that you uh, joined us today. Uh, and thank you very much for those words, uh, which I think are going to be followed closely by the people who are attending today. So uh, thanks again. And with that, we're going mm -hmm. to move on now to our first uh, main presenter. Uh, and I can't think of a better person to talk about this subject uh, than Jaco Human, who is the executive officer of the Industrial Gas Users Association of Southern Africa. And he is co-chair of the BUSA Gas Energy Subcommittee. And he provides leadership to industry on gas energy availability, on policy and pricing. And Jaco has been the CEO of Value Chain Constructs since 2016, providing strategic consulting and advisory services to private and public sector clients on gas energy strategy, capital projects, and a broad spectrum <coughs> of supply chain <coughs> optimization issues. He was the head of group procurement at NAMPAC from 2012 to 2016, and the group supply chain executive at Consul Glass from 2002 to 2012. And before that, he held senior supply chain and project management positions at ESCOM, uh, from 1994 to 2002. Yako has a bachelor's and master's degree in economics from the University of Stellenbosch. Uh, thanks for joining us, Yako, and over to you for your presentation. Chris, thank you very much for the opportunity um, to discuss these very important matters to, to a broader audience. I think I think the 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 development of this whole landscape is is at a at a very sort of precarious point. And it is very, very important and critical. And hopefully the message that we convey this afternoon um, will, will land uh, at the right audiences in order to make certain decisions in a very short period of time. When, Chris, when you contacted me around gas to power and gas energy security, I mean, we, I thought, you know, how, how best to <laughs> approach this point because I actually went back into the records that, that we had for some time and, and, and the discussions on this particular point. And we'll touch on these sort of recurring themes a little bit. So I think without further ado, we'll 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 touch this afternoon on the what we call the customary dialogue. Um I think it is Silas that said that um plans are in place. Um and the plans have been in place for some time, but we don't see movement. Um We'll talk about the stakes, in other words, what, what is really at play here, and then touch on the solution, and then if there's time allowed, of course, um, Q&A. So just by way of introduction, the Industrial Gas User Association, non-profit organization, and the mandate is, sits in the space of energy security, gas energy security, pricing, it's a regulated environment, and of course, uh, gas energy policy. These organizations, I'll explain to you a little bit uh, more later on where and, and how they fit into, into the uh, gas energy space. But it essentially it is the, the, the backbone of the primary manufacturing sector in South Africa. Let's turn a little bit to the customary dialogue. And I think it is important to step a little bit back in time. And, you know, if, 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 if you look at the development of gas in South Africa, the, we see five distinct stages. There were some bold, very important moves, very progressive moves between 98 and 2005. White paper on energy came out, the Gas Act was drafted and promulgated, and the regulatory agreements between SASL at that point, the South African 
government um, and the Mozambican government led to the development of the infrastructure we by and large have today. Bold moves, but largely dependent on a key off-taker being Cecil Gas. The second phase that we see uh, from 26 to 2012, we see that gas energy is, is it, it matures in the South African market. Lots of industries changes to the use of gas energy, make the necessary capital investments. These are long-term investments that play large capital outlays in order to adapt to new sources of energy. <clears throat> We see that gas starts to find a place in policy. The emergence of shale gas potential is reported. And then, of course, the, the, the major discoveries in Mozambique and Tanzania, uh, which will enable future regional trade. Of course, blackouts, uh, load shedding started in uh, 20, 2008. And then ESCOM at that stage turns to, uh, as, a, as, a, as a response to that, to the costly use of uh, open cycle gas turbines for power generation. The following phase was actually, up to that point, we, we actually saw a very progressive and developing gas market in South Africa, but it turned, and it turned rapidly for the worse, and it left South Africa behind during this period. During this time, we saw the development of global LNG markets, the availability of uh, short-term contracts, attracting new buyers. Mozambique really took off. We expect uh, around about $128 billion investment up to 2029. SA announced various programs around gas uh, in, in the energy mix, the gas utilization master plan some 10, 11 years ago. But unfortunately, the, the state was not to act nor execute on any, any of these gas policies anytime soon. We entered a period of stagnation. Downscaling of international gas majors' presence in South Africa as they exited this world of, 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 of no progression in gas energy. And it basically left us with a table, a very empty table, um, during this next phase that we see from 2019 to 2023. Now, <clears throat> during this time, we started to experience gas energy shortages. No additional molecules injected into the system. It stagnates. Um, there's no focus on infrastructure developments, really, so to speak of. There's policy uncertainty as the future role of gas, the energy mix and the timing thereof. Gas energy insecurity, of course, amidst this dwindling supply. Um, it became, in, during 2018, 2019, it became apparent to us that around about 26, 27 onwards, we will have problems. Um, we had certain irrational outcomes from a regulatory perspective uh, during this period. Um, untouched, undeveloped upstream gas potential, nothing moved there. SADC, of course, excluding South Africa, rapidly advances on, on, on their own gas potential. So <clears throat> the SA stayed in absolute abeyance during this period, and we see an increasingly regressive role of state-owned entities. In other words, entities making plans, but do not execute on these particular plans. And of course, that led to major market uncertainty. This all landed in 2024, where we're finding ourselves. So Sassel indeed confirms a gas cliff in 30 months. There's no discernible alternative project, really, so to speak of. No investment decision has been made. Significant investments continue in Mozambique. We see the state role remains unclear to us, and hopefully that will change in due course but significant industrial investments have been halted, particularly those on the gas user front. Overall energy landscape and network economy deterioration bearing down on our competitiveness, we'll touch on it a little bit later. And of course, the SA state policy absent, um, absence, uh, missing these very critical timelines that we are now faced with. All in all, we need very, very bold decisions, um, but very fast. Going back, just, just to refresh our memories and, and reflect, Transnet, of course, came out in 2019 and said by 2024, we will have LNG terminals in South Africa operating. It will be, and we see the first references to power, uh, gas to power generation here. We see that there are plans afoot to develop the necessary infrastructure around South, South Africa, Richards Bay by 2025 and then the enablement of gas to power. Also, NERSA or Transnet at that point had a very clear plan, right? And the plan basically set out from 2015, in fact, the plan was 
these, these plans were on the table and it dealt with various various aspects of the development of infrastructure, the cooperation of various government departments, international financing arrangements, regulatory approvals, et cetera. But from 2020, it basically stopped. Nothing developed from that point forward until recently when we heard about announcements for future LNG infrastructure in the Regents Bay. So this boat certainly we missed. The next, the next Sassel position, which was quite interesting about five years ago, just going through our through our library of records, Sassel took also a view that the IRP, referencing the IRP, that the that there is a distinct link between gas to power and the development of much needed infrastructure. Um, it, the reference is Transnet's project with the LNG terminal in 2024, and it references the um, concessions that were made in Mozambique during that time for LNG importation for facilities and power generation. The important point here is that the link between power generation and infrastructure development is a recurring theme that we see. Following on from that, Sassel also put this forward and they said, we have a declining gas curve. At that stage, Sassel indicated that around about 24, 25, maybe with some interventions, we could extend the bridge a little bit more during this period, but we are in fact looking at a gas decline. So this is not new. This has been known for some time. Sassel at the same time says we need to in we increase our throughput of gas into South Africa. And again, it re references power generation as a key player in the development of the gas uh, in meeting future gas demand. Iguasa's position at that stage, I mean, we've written similar letters uh, to the DMRE, um, even the presidency, all other government stakeholders. In essence, these highlighted sections, we, 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 we emphasize the point that a gas supply crisis is imminent. Um, and at that stage, we viewed this as the next energy challenge for South Africa. Now that has certainly become um, real in recent times. Again, the highlighted sections here, we refer to the, the anchoring of power on gas to gas, gas infrastructure, receiving infrastructure, gas meeting gas demand, and so on, and also the role of the gas, the need for, for policy and the gas utilization master plan. So clearly, the all the things that we're highlighting today is actually very similar to the things we've highlighted five, six years ago. We also, some of you may recall this particular diagram where we said we expect gas decline um, around about the 2024 level, certain interventions would again bring us closer or, or extend the bridge for about two years. But nevertheless, there's an increase in gas demand and the shortfall need to be met very, very soon. All of this actually led to the culmination of a position at that time. We really, we, 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 we actually said that we have a gas energy crunch. The state through its various entities um, has a significant role to play, but is certainly not playing it at that point. Um, we see also, this is a very important point here, as you can see, and I'll come back to this, and we suffer scale, demand scale in South Africa for gas developments. And, and this, is a, this is a point that we will emphasize later on. At that point, we said that we have to create together with the state, we have to create the necessary demand for gas in order to develop gas infrastructure to provide gas energy security. We see the role of the state as being a catalyst rather as a controller of the gas economy development. And we see then the need for an urgent state private sector collaboration structure to, to address these, these, these key concerns. This led to Sassel's position moving on to 2022. Sassel at the end of 2022 basically set their position uh, to industry and the markets and basically said from FY22 to 28, we can extend our gas bridge by a short period. And we're looking at certain interventions, infilling, drilling, the use of PSA gas where possible. And we can even extend that bridge further 
up to beyond 2028, 20, 2030, around that time, with the exploration of PT5C gas. This, unfortunately, has not materialized in our view, and Sassel had to make very urgent decisions um, at the beginning of last year. And that essentially culminated in Sassel exiting the market for gas. There have been in discussions with customers explicitly so to indicate that Sassel Gas, which has been investing in the PPA, is not able to extend and afford uh, gas supply from FY26 onwards. At the same time, previously, we've also communicated to our customers that the methane-rich gas will actually um, be phased out by FY26 because we need that gas for the decarbonization of our own operations. And Cecil announces the exit from the markets for third-party gas supply during August 2023. And from that point onwards, industry had to take certain positions and started to engage with various stakeholders around the solutions around uh, uh, the future of gas. We've Considering that there are no particular gas, gas infrastructure or discernible solutions in the ground today. There are solutions, and we'll touch on that just now. What are the stakes? Industry at the moment, if you look at the time risk, that is probably the biggest issue that we face. Sassel's point of view at the moment, and if we focus on BGC and the Matola solution, Sassel's point of view is that BGC is the most discernible and ready project to deliver LNG or gas needs going forward. However, their position also states that we will overshoot day zero, which is this red line in June 2026. We will overshoot day zero by about 12 months. Romco, in discussions with Romco, certain infrastructure projects need to happen. Romco sets out very, very uh, constructively and, and technically the plans to facilitate interconnections with the Romco pipeline. Again, BGC, Matola development dependent, but also very importantly, the linkage between the Romco and the Lilly pipeline. This pipeline, Romco believes, could be ready by day zero. And then, of course, in terms of the other interconnections, it also overshoots that particular point in time. BGC Total Energy's point of view, their position is that they will reach FID around about uh, middle of this year in 2024. Financial close will follow, and then the development of these projects will take place within a two-year period after that. The problem with this particular picture is that we have a dead zone already. We have significant project risk and e economic risk to the country presented by this particular shaded sector here. As you can see, these are the best intentions um, provided and all very much hinged on BGC FID, as you can see here. Sassel Transmission, as the operator, is saying, no problem, we can move the gas. And... The problem then results in this particular space, which we don't have a firm, clear solution yet. There are solutions, and we'll come to that just now. What is at stake? The industry, as we see at the moment, Iguasa members only contribute about 300 billion rand per year to the economy. We employ 65,000 people. We use 40 petajoules. These exclude, of course, 500 small to medium get, uh, enterprises, gas users out there, the households that's been referred to uh, that, that receives gas at the moment, significant amount of smaller enterprises, and then, of course, the indirect economic contribution multiplier that sits within these value chains of large industry. We can say that fixed capital investment has stopped in late 2023 from many of, from many of the in industries of the energy landscape for gas going forward. That, of course, is already a, will, will have an immediate, immediate term impact on the economic development and reinvestment, and we need to find those solutions very, very soon. Energy substitution, it's a conversation we have many times over, but it's technically limited. We cannot simply switch from gas to other, other, other sources purely because of the technical setups of much of the production lines and the furnaces that, 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 that we use gas in. 
we also see supply chain constraints in substitutes. The price slope, the price slope is very important. We see domestic gas or well gas, as we find see it now, natural gas, sometimes referred to as well as the most economically feasible alternative. The next stop is LNG. After that, you're getting into the alternatives being HFO, diesel fuel, LPG, and those. So we have to switch from an economic perspective to the next best alternative being LNG. Of course, all of this is linked to decarbonization, all these decisions around substitution. And uh, adding on to um, Silas earlier, the decarbonization is, is a critical element also in the manufacturing space. We are then faced with certain impacts. We see the investment hard stop from 2024 onwards in terms of fixed capital investment. We see reduced output at this point from 2026 if nothing changes and definitely closures uh, by plants and, and factories uh, in KZN, Pomalanga and Gauteng. Loss of competitiveness already at play. We are subject to increased network economic costs in energy, logistics, water, all these elements. And we see increasing SADC industrialization, access to cheap domestic gas energy next door. And this is, this is a reality and something that we as a country need to keep an eye out all the time. Regional location, global shareholder fatigue in South Africa. We have many global companies, of course, in our, in our membership, but they are getting tired of the problems and our inability to solve problems in South Africa as we move forward to develop the economy. Move to energy access. In other words, knocking on neighbors' doors where energy are available and abundant and cheaply so. And of course, that leads to the inevitable capital and jobs exodus. Carbon competitiveness in this changing world, um, a discussion for a different day. Let's talk about the solution briefly. Currently, we have the system, which may be familiar to most of us in, 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 in the audience. Gas is supplied from Pandit Tamani, and we expect this decline um, to, to come in around about 25, 26. We have gas flowing to Maputo. The bulk of it reaches Secunda, where it actually then turns down to uh, methane-rich gas being produced, and Secunda then flows to uh, KZN. And then, of course, the... Um, the triangular distribution west of Secunda um, uh, with gas flow to the majority of industry in that part of the country. So this has been the position over the last 20 years. It has not developed and changed much, um, which unfortunately is an indictment on ourselves in terms of the development of the gas economy. In fact, we have regressed if you consider what is what, what has played out um, uh, of the south coast in South Africa, being Mossel Bay. What needs to happen is straightforward and simple. We have literally have four months to switch on the landing lights on the development of gas infrastructure to substitute the shortfall in supply from 2026 onwards. The focus here, as highlighted here, is the development of the, the uh, infrastructure at Maputo and, of course, the linkage, very important, between the Romco and the Lilly pipeline to provide gas energy security to um, KZN. Why not Richards Bay during this time? Richards Bay is very promising. We are we welcome the announcements recently by Transnet to award projects um, regarding LNG infrastructure to VOPEC and Transnet. Um, we view this as a big issue in terms of project dependency. There's basically four things that need to happen before we see anything in the Richards Bay in the near future. First of all, we need to see progress and action on the development of marine side infrastructure or key side infrastructure. That is the, the ambit of the Transnet National Ports Authority. We need to see the bankability of the business case of the VOPAC TPL consortium for on-land uh, regasification and the LNG storage terminal. We need to see the pipeline interconnections um, up to Secunda um, and the ability to move gas from Richards Bay to Secunda. And largely, we, we need to see the development and certainty around gas to power in the Richards Bay. We have the view that, that these, 
these these requirements will not be met within the necessary time frame and certainly not within the next four to five months as we see the development. Hence, the focus remains on Maputo, which we view as the best or, or the most shovel-ready project that we have, but we have to focus on the development of the business case for those projects. Beyond 27, of course, the landscape changes significantly. We welcome the focus um, in the IRP on gas to power because, as earlier indicated, we see a significant linkage between uh, gas to power developments and gas infrastructure and gas energy access in general. And of course, these discussions and how these things will play out remains of academical importance, but we do see South Africa moving into a gas economic space. But we first need to deal with the short term issues um, as a matter of urgency. So from our point of view, the ask is relatively simple. We have to ensure viable gas demand in addition to industrial gas demand for the critical receiving infrastructure investment in Matola. This could be done by focusing on the gas to power requirement. And there are two options the way we see it. We have to specify the geographic location in the gas master plan, whether it's the IRP 23 or the, or the um, uh, current inquiries for gas to power for facilities power generation facilities along the Romco gas pipeline. The next option that we have, maybe it's a combination of it, is to facilitating energy purchase agreements or electricity purchase agreements with Mozambique for electricity to support the investment, the critical investment in the gas infrastructure uh, in, it, uh, in, in, in Matola. So government certainly has a role to play in switching on the landing lights for these critical infrastructure developments, and we have to do so in the next four to five months. We have to facilitate the connection of the Romco and the Lilly pipeline. These are CEF, uh, Central Energy Fund and Transnet owned before 2026, where they converge at Secunda to provide KZN with gas optionality over the very short term. If government can play a role um, around getting these projects off the ground, we believe that the provision of sovereign guarantees would certainly play a significant role to mitigate the economic risk to South Africa. The ask, we believe, is not too complex, but we have to provide the private sector with the necessary landing lights or guidance or, or clarity around what will happen where. Otherwise, the stakes are high and we will see, see and enter that dead zone, which is a big concern to us. Thank you very much, Chris. Well, thank you very much, Jaco, uh, for uh, really setting the scene for today and the context. Uh, if I could ask you, yeah, thank you for st uh, stopping and sharing. Uh, you really did provide us a uh, quite an alarming context of what really is being faced. And I think it's now appropriate that we need to start talking about the solutions. So uh, it's really my pleasure now to introduce to you uh, Yuri Swart. Uh, Yuri is the CEO of GigaJoule, and he joined uh, GigaJoule as a CEO in 2020, working closely with Johan de Foss, the executive chairman uh, of GigaJoule. Uh, GigaJoule itself is a project developer and the owner of uh, that is active in the midstream and downstream natural gas and gas to power industry, primarily focusing on Mozambique. Yuri was involved with African Infrastructure Investment Managers, that's AIIM, since its inception in 2000. He served as CEO from 2014 to 2020 as the Head of Infrastructure at Old Mutual Alternative Investments from 2007 to 2020. And he continues to serve on the AIIF Fund Series Investment Committees. He started his working career as a civil engineer, as a civil engineering contractor, working on large engineering projects before converting to finance. So it's going to be really interesting to hear what you have to say. You've seen a lot from Yako's talk about uh, the critical role of Maputo and uh, gas supplies from Mozambique. And we're looking forward to hearing your presentation. Over uh, to you, Yuri. 
Right. If um, Yaku spoke earlier about the alternatives, obviously the alternatives um, that need to be considered um, uh, as we as we approach the gas cliff. Now, um, clearly there are technical issues um, in converting. Uh, we've done an approximate range of what the alternatives are, the cost of the alternatives to LNG. We fully appreciate that the price of and the cost of LNG is at a price point above the current solution from the pundit to mining fields. But if we look at the graph um, on, on the screen there, um, the, the alternatives are actually quite scary. The LPG low is uh, a little bit of a fallacy. It's not a, not a reality. The, the price point of LPG is um, uh, considerably higher than where, where we see LNG coming in. The other point to make is just that the onshore natural gas fines simply cannot reach the volumes required to satisfy the needs of the industrial gas users. Uh, currently, only about 10% of that third party volume that Jaku spoke, spoke about is being satisfied by, um, by the small onshore fields. Of course, the risk uh, of us not acting fairly urgently is that energy users, in fact, some energy users will be forced to alternatives, including coal. The LNG import terminal, and I particularly wanted to avoid death by PowerPoint on the BGC project, because I think many participants on this um, um, cast have, have already seen the slides. But just as a reminder, the LNG import terminal is being planned as a, as a classic FSRU type technology um, uh, to be birthed on the very last birth in the port of Matola. And then uh, the pipeline to follow up to up the Matola River and join the existing gas network of Matola Gas Company, MGC, that has been operating um, in, uh, in Matola Maputu for the last um, 20 years. The Matola pipeline will then be looped for approximately 70 kilometers in the existing clear servitude uh, and join Romco at the border at Rosana Garcia. Now, the, the volumes that BGC is, or is, is, is specking is more than sufficient to solve the gas cliff problem, i.e. as uh, the Panditamani fields decrease, um, uh, MG, uh, the BGC um, uh, regasified LNG and we pushed into the Ronco pipeline. With the Sassol announcement, that reality is, is, is not really a phase anymore. It's, it's quite simply, there's a switch off date and there's a switch on date for the, for the uh, uh, BGC LNG. The project itself, and I'll take you through that just now, is, uh, is, is for all intents and purposes shovel ready. Um, but it requires some action. And that action at the end of the day is solving the offtake. And let me give you a little bit of background to why we say solving the offtake is, is, is not, not so simple. If you look at the, the gas networks that you'll find in, in Europe, for example, it's a very well established network of, uh, and of distribution and transmission. And basically, as we've seen over the last um, few years post Ukraine, you can plug in FSRUs at any, any point in that network, and you've got all manner of offtake points. So the, the, the risk of offtake is substantially decreased. What we have here is effectively an end-to-end -end system where we've got a semi-developed um, network with a supply point at the one end. There are no alternatives if that gets, um, if, if, if the, the offtake fails. So, so the, the benefits of BGC is that it has relatively easy access to that existing uh, gas transmission network. Um, we spoke about, or Yaku spoke about the volumes, and if we speak about 40 petajoules uh, of um, uh, CNI gas um, uh, as, as the day one availability in, uh, in 2026, we ideally need more than that. And when I say ideally need more than, uh, more than that is this is all a numbers game and the scale benefit um, uh, 
to the price. Um, in our estimation, at 100 petajoules, we get to a point which it really is um, is much easier to launch the project. So our view currently is that it, it should be the 40 petajoules from uh, CNI gas and uh, if we said 60 petajoules at least from the from a power anchor off tank, which is about 1,200 megawatts at base load. You'll see a little bit later, we have the ability to do more than that in power, i.e. to if, if we were to achieve a, a 2,000 megawatt off take today, it would be able to kick the project off comfortably on its own. But we see this coexistence between or, or complementary existence between the pure gas users and the gas to power, power um, um, uh, projects. Having said that, we are pursuing all avenues to kickstart the project um, um, uh, earlier. Um, as Yaku said, it's, it's, it's simply there is no time left. That pink zone he spoke of, um, which is um, the time between the announced TESOL um, point of termination and the implementation or the COD of, of, of the BGC project. We'd like to believe that that can be brought forward, um, but there is a, is a gap there. So we are pursuing all all avenues to, to kickstart earlier. Just to give you some feedback and uh, or, or some illustration of what happened on the Matola Gas uh, Company um, or Matola Gas Company's experience in, in uh, Matola, where we essentially kicked off with a, a single off taker with a little bit of additional on the industrial side. Once the infrastructure was put in the ground, in 2005, we kicked off. We started just on a regular basis adding industrial uh, uh, clients. Um, and every now and again, there was a nice big uptick where there was an additional large industrial user that would come on board. But the point I'm trying to make is that once the project is in the ground, it unleashes that latent um, uh, demand that is sitting there. And we're pretty convinced the same thing is going to happen in South Africa. There's a, a, a large pent up demand of gas users who simply have not been able to convert to gas to start using gas because of the lack of supply. The other thing that, that, uh, that um, occurred in the case of, of Matola Gas Company was that it enabled and stimulated a, a vibrant gas to power. Uh, market and gas to power offtake with four plants in total now in, in, in the southern part of Mozambique. And you can see what that did to the volumes in, in, uh, Matola, in the Matola Gas Company case. Um, even today, as we speak, and gas has become a, a, a scarce resource, we are looking in this short term to close to double the industrial offtake that you see at the end of the graph there on the right hand side. So really, it's very easy to say <laughs> because there's a chicken and egg here, but we're very conf confident it's a build and they will come type uh, situation. We just need to find the, the enough uh, to get us going on day one. To give you a, a, a quick rundown of BGC, the, the Matola import terminal to give you a rundown of the, um, the timeline to date uh, and what has been achieved and why I say we are practically shovel ready at but for text is the conception of the BGC project actually goes all the way back to 2012 when there were the first indications as existing gas users in, in Maputo, we took a look at the reserve reports and, uh, and came to the conclusion that there was trouble on the horizon, that Panditamani is not a never ending resource. And, and the end of Panditamani is probably closer than what most people are appreciating. We then did studies and we, we considered the various options, including the, the uh, pipe, uh, potential for a pipeline from Northern Mozambique. Um, it came to the conclusion that an LMG import terminal in Matola is the most optimal, both for us to replace our gas needs in MGC, um, um, as well as for the, for the South African gas users. 
Um, we then set about in 2016 doing the free feed studies and, and, and et cetera, heading up to the concession award for two things, A, the LNG import terminal and B, a 2000 megawatt uh, power station in Matola. And the concession, concession awards were in 2019. From the date of concession award, we kicked off the development activities. Um, the EIA uh, timeline started, with, uh, we kicked off with the feed studies um, and the uh, uh, MSF, uh, um, MFS, sorry, uh, studies on the, the power station. And, and that has been ongoing leading up to um, the full EIA approval and award in 2023, uh, completion of all the engineering studies and uh, Call for RFP on, uh, on um, uh, EPCs and having EPCs shortlisted. Um, what is required to complete now is clearly commercial offtake finalization, then to engage the lenders um, uh, in, in short order, uh, leading up to financial close. Um, as I said to you, the timeline that that uh, Yaku put up earlier, we certainly believe that we can bring that forward somewhat provided we are able to achieve commercial offtake finalization in, in relatively short order. Development spend to date is $10 million. And that uh, we, we anticipate will go up some more so to, to financial close. To give some background with regards to the gas to power solution that sits um, in, in the very close to the BGC import terminal. And just to revisit the, the, the thesis for why we chose uh, Matola as, um, as a site for, uh, for, a, uh, for the power station is A, it's at sea level, substantial, substantially more efficient than what you would find at the high felt. Secondly, we are very close to the LNG import terminal, i.e the cost of gas transport in, that feeds into the power, the, the power tariff is minimized. There's the existing um, evacuation infrastructure uh, through the Matraco lines with full redundancy on 1,000 megawatts, uh, currently transporting power both from Arnett and Camden down to uh, the Mazal smelter. And then lastly, there's a large user in, uh, in the smelter right on the doorstep. So the site that we have secured in, in, in Beledan in Matola is ideally positioned. Again, in terms of the CTP power plant, development milestones have been completed in lockstep with BGC. Um, and we've, we've said for some time now, we have a ready solution for, to, the, uh, to contributing to relieving and alleviating the current electricity crisis. Unfortunately, um, the, the IPP process excludes any cross-border um, projects. So we are um, running on a, down an avenue of our own, if I can call it that. The project can be phased. It can be done in various steps. Uh, ideally, the sort of six to 700 megawatt steps to get large turbines that are most efficient, um, but it can be built in various phases. Um, it can uh, have first power on the grid within 24 months, uh, followed by the, if you, if you start with the open cycle turbines, um, followed uh, uh, roughly 12 months after that with the combined cycle, um, the back end of the combined cycle process. If I were to give you some value for money comparisons of, to, to private users, in our calculation, the, the power supplied from the CDB project will be competitive with Megaflex um, at date of COD. Um, if we take very reasonable uh, uh, escalation into account for, for, for current ESCOM Megaflex. And I'll tell you now why we think those, those lines will converge. Um, the future, in the future energy security has to be number one on any risk register in corporate South Africa at the moment. And it, it also gives, uh, provides private users with a solution that uh, immunates it, uh, against um, uncertain ESCOM increases in the future. If, 
it were to be an ESCOM or Government of South Africa type offtake, um, 30% of the, uh, the, the current tariff by our estimation is in the region of 30% of the price of uh, diesel per kilowatt hour that's currently being burnt. If we compare that to the cost of load shedding to our economy, it's even less than the uh, even smaller percentage than it is of diesel. And furthermore, uh, this is a difficult one to get a number on, but uh, we believe it's below the cost of what it's, what it's, what it's costing to keep the old coal fired uh, plants going as we speak. Um, so from a value, value for money um, uh, perspective, it looks to me to be a, a no-brainer. We compare with, with previous bid program tariffs, we're also below the, the points that those came out at. Um, the gas to power also contributes strongly to grid stability um, and complements renewable out rollout. Now, using the word complements renewable uh, rollout here, because I think there's far too much emphasis of gas to power being uh, only only there as a balancer of renewables. It certainly helps and, and um, is able to play the role of the dispatchable power uh, next to next to renewable energy. But so if 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 we look at the um, the energy horizon in South Africa and the and the old coal-fired power plants and their points of uh, imminent decommissioning, um, we think there's going to be a far larger role for gas-fired power in the base load role. <clears throat> okay, now, when I said um, we uh, will mitigate against the uncertain um, future ESCOM increases, I think it's important to point out that uh, our estimation or in, in, in our calculations the uh, energy tariff or the electricity tariff from our power station, only approximately 20% of that tariff will be exposed to a fluctuating gas index. This is due to the fact that we're looking at uh, Henry Hub pricing index, which means that a very large portion of the molecule cost is actually fixed, i.e. the cost of liquefaction and the cost of transport. The, the balance over and above the 20% that is um, is uh, exposed to gas, uh, a gas index, the balance is split between fixed and USPPI escalation, or roughly half and half, fluctuates a little bit either way. Um, but just to make the point that popularly everyone speaks about, ooh, gas to power um, is, is subject to large fluctuations in index, only 20% is subject to index fluctuation. Then I just wanted to add some thoughts with regards to the energy mix, given the topic of the day. If you look at the graph on the left-hand side, total power generation in, in terawatt hours increased by 90% across the world, I'm talking about the world electricity generation by source, increased from 2000 to 2022 by 90%, and the world power sector emissions by source went up 79%. If we take that if we took the coal in 2000 and we, oops, sorry, and we um, halved the coal instead of growing it by 30%, 36%, we halved the coal and we took that additional power that was generated and spread it between 25% renewable energy, 25% nuclear, 50% gas. The world sector emissions would have increased by uh, by eighteen percent instead of by seventy nine percent. If I can put this into a practical illustration, and I've randomly selected, and I say randomly, of course, it's one that illustrates well, but it's not the only country that's 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 in this boat. But take the United Kingdom as an example. Over the same period, they significantly grew the renewables contribution between 2000 and 2022. They, for all intents and purposes, phased out um, coal. The gas and nuclear slug stayed relatively constant over that period. And in the process, they were able to practically, if you look on the right, practically halve the uh, megatons of uh, CO2 emissions uh, generated within that economy. In summary, 
I think it's not to be underestimated if we don't resolve the, the issue that, uh, that Kyako introduced, that the impact uh, on our economy is significant. BTC and CDB, um, as two complementary projects in, 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 in um, accumulating enough offtake, the CDB project accumulating enough offtake to kick off the BTC project, um, are credible solutions that can best meet the timelines um, in, in comparison to what we see out there at the moment. It, in short, we can get two for the price of one. We solve the gas prices and we can make a significant benefit and uh, uh, significantly benefit the electricity prices. But action is required immediately. And then at the risk of sounding very melodramatic, um, we, we all speak about this wonderful um, demographic dividend that we have in Africa um, relative to the rest of the world, the young population, where, uh, where most other large economies are facing very aging population. We have this huge opportunity before us. However, that's a double-edged sword. Um, it comes with the obligation, and I've used the word obligation, to, to employ those young people gainfully, else they will just migrate and become the young, uh, young population in the established economies. The only way to do that is to create um, and to maintain industries that are completely reliant on energy. We simply have to act in this way. Thank you, Chris. Well, thank you indeed, um, Yuri, for that uh, interesting talk, uh, really focused on the solutions to this gas cliff and, of course, the solutions, uh, some of the solutions to the electricity crisis. Pleased to tell you that we've got two very interesting uh, presentations lined up. Uh, the first, of course, is by the CEO of the Romco Pipeline Company. And as you've heard, they are critical to solving this uh, gas cliff as well as uh, you know, playing a role in a possible gas to power project. Um, and the other uh, speaker or presenter uh, is the CEO of Quande Gas. And they are a gas uh, trading company also uh, within their group is, um, you know, a, a, a trading company that uh, supplies uh, gas to the KwaZulu Natal and Durban areas um, that is spring, uh, uh, spring lights and uh, gas. Uh, so uh, we really got two fantastic presentations coming up. And it's my great pleasure now to introduce you to Landesi Boyce. Uh, and Landesi is an experienced and multi-skilled international business leader with senior management strategy, business development, and business intelligence experience in the petrochemical and gas to liquid sector. His experience covers uh, managing strategic business units in Nigeria and managing the business intelligence in China, India, Uzbekistan, Indonesia, Mozambique, Tanzania, and South Africa. Um, Lanzani uh, served as a senior manager, joint venture management for gas sourcing at Sassel Energy and as country manager in Nigeria at the Sassel International Energy Company before his appointment as CEO of Romco in 2019. He has leadership acumen in joint venture business development, commercial negotiations, stakeholder management, and gas infrastructure development. So with that, it's my great pleasure to hand over uh, to the CEO of Romco. If I can ask you to switch your camera on, uh, and give your presentation. We're looking forward to hearing. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chris. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Um, just want to see if I can move. Chris, can you see my presentation moving? I'm yes, trying to set we, we can see it, and it has moved to the first slide. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, everyone. Um, I think my presentation... Um, I tend to basically emphasize more on certain points that have been more, uh, made earlier on. Um, we're going to touch more on the gas supply, which is the historic gas supply to, to today, and then look at the impact of the Matola to Romco specifically, as well as, um, uh, as South Africa. And then also looking at how our, our pipeline um, is designed from a, a, a capacity point of view. Um, the, the way I'm trying, I'd like to follow here, I won't follow the order of the numbers. I'll start from the top. 
Um, the, uh, I will start from the, the, the number three that we see here. This is pandemic manifolds that we are talking about um, to date, right? Um, let me just drop that. These are the pandemic manifolds that we're talking about um, to date. Uh, these fields, um, they came about early 2000. Um, as we're talking today, they they basically service both South Africa and Mozambique, and we're talking about less than 3 TCF of, of gas that was um, um, discovered back then. If we're looking at the gas that's currently available in Mozambique, we're probably talking about 180 TCF. So if I'm saying Pan and Teman in just both those fields, they were less than 3 TCF, and we can imagine what 180 TCF will do um, 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 of gas in the Mozambican side. Um, if we go down, that's then um, the Romco pipeline that we are uh, basically, uh, uh, everyone is talking about today. How did Romco came about? Um, the Pan and Temani fields were considered a standard uh, gas field. Then we, there was a need that we needed then to move these volumes into the market and that market will be in South Africa as well as in Mozambique. Then that vehicle um, was Romco, which was established around 2002, 2001. And that's when we started to the construction of the, of the pipeline itself. Um, 2004, that was our BO, we started moving the gas into South African market. The San Lucasia, that's uh, critical for us from a Romco perspective, that most of the gas that we are moving in, in Mozambique um, um, I, it's then a uh, tie off from that point is taken from, from there. In, in Mozambique, we, we service a lot, um, gas right. to power, which is, um, CTRG as well as Kurvaninga. Um, and Mozambique market takes about 36 petajoules. Um, and the rest of the volumes that we're moving, then we bring them in South Africa. South Africa takes about, um, 161, um, uh, petajoules a year. So in total, from a, a volume perspective, we, we move roughly about 197 petajoules um, in, into the market. Now we, we then get to the point where we talk about the 2026 um, announcement, both for natural gas as well as um, methane rich gas. We, where we're sitting from a Romco perspective, we then look at, um, we will still continue pushing gas to South Africa, but when it's come to 2026, then we need to look at different options. Um, what 2026 provides for Romco is an opportunity, especially around the MRG, I think um, Yago did touch that, that um, a link between the Romco and, and, and the Lily pipeline. But also for this thing to happen, for this connection or link to happen, um, we have quite a few parties that needs to come online. You, you have Transnet that needs to be uh, um, um, on the table, Sasol that needs to be on the table, as well as Rompo that needs to come on the table. Only challenge is that we're talking about 2026. Um, it takes to do these projects takes about two to three years. Um, and, 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 and reality is we don't have time and decisions needs to be taken. We, we also note the fact that around these uh, fields, we have PT5C, um, which uh, to a certain degree, um, um, uh, Yako did touch on it. We don't know, uh, this field has not been quantified, um, and but we also know that if once it's quantified, but also there's a development there, uh, of the field that still have to come in. Um, if it's, it's, it's significant enough, we do foresee that maybe that, that those volumes will, will come into the pipeline. Um, if we look at number six, um, we, we have Renegen, um where we do foresee that a virtual pipeline or small scale LNG will be at play, given the fact that the, as, a, as a country, we don't have a well-developed gas infrastructure. So to supplement that, we will then need um, um, bring in the what we call it the virtual pipeline. I think from a Ronco point of perspective as well, especially around this area in Pumalanga, um, from our compressor uh, station, we're also looking at activities that how can we then spread the wings um, other than putting a physical pipeline, but also looking at um, putting virtual pipeline, which is moving gas um, via truck. Um, on the on the 
side of Rishas Bay, we do pay attention um, the TPL and Volpe consortium um, to deliver the LNG terminal um, import. The, these discussions need to happen because if we talk about the connection um, of Lili to Romco, then the question will be asked, how is that going to impact the Rishas Bay uh, 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 project development? I mean, uh, Yago did touch a lot in terms of when you're looking at a project maturity of all the projects that are currently sitting to date, um, we, we can all agree that Matola is a bit way ahead uh, compared to this project. And also when you're looking at the time frame um, and time frame in terms of 2026, um, which of the project can you push as much as uh, possible to ensure that um, we've got the gas beyond 2026? So this is basically high level summary in terms of a background and um, in terms of how the gas is supplied in, in, the, in both in Mozambique as well in South Africa. So if we look at um, the impact of Matola to Romco, over the past couple of years, uh, and I'll say couple of years, over the past two years to three years, um, we've been engaging with potential customers who are requesting um, a, a capacity into our pipeline. And we, and everyone basically is talking about the additional volume because ever since the announcement, remember the announcement of about the, the depletion of the gas field was announced in 2018. Um, and then the discussion was that it comes 2024, um, the, the fields will deplete. But then so much work that has been done in the background that that time uh, the plateau was extended to 2026. So to date, um, since then, people have been coming to Romco looking for a, a, a spare capacity if they can move volume into the country. Um, and we envisage that these additional volumes will come via um, will come via Matola, which is the BGC project that um, uh, Yuri was uh, 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 was giving more detail on it. So. What we've done from a Romco point of view, because yes, you, you've got this FSRU that will be sitting in Matola, then you need, as Louis mentioned, you mentioned earlier on, that you they will loop back into our pipeline. So it means that we have to create a tie-in to ensure that we enable the volume back to South Africa. We've done um, some commercial um, um, as well as technical work uh, on, on, on this work, on the, on the tie-in. We've completed our fit, uh, technical field package in June 2023. The challenge with that, um, we can't continue with the project because before we take FID, at least we need to have bankable um, gas um, transmission uh, agreement, um, uh, what we call it GTAs. We in the space of creating um, um, uh, capacity, but we have to raise capital. And for us to raise that capital, we have to show that there will be um, offtake um, in the market. And therefore, then we will need the market to commit. And I think this is the similar position that you find himself in, that he needs about 40 better jewels of the market to commit. And also from a wrong point of view, we also need the market to make that commitment for us to move as quick as possible. Um, I like the 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 time frame that um, Yako showed earlier on. We have been in engagement with um, MGC over the past two years, and trying to see how can we assist one another to ensure that we will reach a, a alignment in terms of executing this project, and and we think we can push the time uh, on a safe um, um, space to ensure that the, the 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 integrity of the project is not compromised. If um, we're looking from a, a capacity point of view, from a Romco specific, now I'm talking to Romco, we are guaranteed to give about 205 petajoules of spare capacity. And um, I've mentioned that we are looking at the tie-in and tying in at Resano Garcia, and that we uh, that design for that particular tie-in is about um, moving about 200 petajoules into the country. The gas profile that you see, or the, the production profile that you see, uh, I just need to qualify it. It's, it's, it's one of the scenarios that um, we, 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 we've developed. Um, this, this scenario basically saying if gas cuts down, right, we then have a fill-in or a replacement gas. So the pan and temane field, as it comes down the cliff, then you have LNG replacing those, those volumes. But also you have to take um, um, note that 
some of the gas, uh, the gas is not going to just drop as you see there. Maybe some of the gas that's currently is, is moving to the industry, Sasol will still keep it to themselves. So that means then the, the blue side, um, the plateau on the blue side will continue over and then the, the LNG will then replace over the period of time. As I mentioned that there's PT5C, we don't know how big, how small, how long will this uh, uh, field be developed, but if it's significant enough, it will then, we do foresee that maybe in future, it will then be pumped into the system. As is today, from a Romgo perspective, um, we have about 40 to 45 better joules of spare capacity in, in, our, in, in our pipeline. Um, we've done some studies uh, where we were looking at non-base um, load for gas to power and see how, if we are able to, to, to basically um, accommodate um, gas to power. So in the event that in Bumalanga, argument's sake that there is a, a one gigawatt that plant that can be put there, World Rom could be able to pull uh, uh, push that 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 gas in, in into into that power. We we'll realize that there is the need to to um, expand our capacity, especially the fact that when you bring in gas to power, it will require us to operate differently um, from a. a, a a pipeline point of view, because if you admit merit or a picking plant, um, the the way the demand or the way the plant will need the gas will be different. Um, the on the current on the day to day that we are using the a, 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 a pipeline, so there is a need for us to expand um, the pipeline itself. So if you look at um, the the Romco uh, future capacity. All the blue that you see from Vilanculis all the way to Secunda, that's our MSP pipeline that is currently sitting in the in the ground. We have loop line one and loop line two um, that also sitting on the ground, and we use these as the way of expanding the capacity of the pipeline. The beauty about our pipeline is that it was designed in such a way that when there's a need um, for additional um, uh, demand or additional capacity, we are able then to expand the capacity by putting the loop line, and we do not need to stop the production and we will continue uh, pushing the volumes while we are building and connecting these loop lines. So today, the work that we've done is that uh, we'll be able to build more loop lines and with the support of compressors, and we can double what we are moving today, especially between Resano Garcia and Secunda. We can double that to 400 petajoules if there is a need in the market. But we don't say we are not saying that we can put the 400 petajoules overnight. It means that we will put one, depending on the need in the market, we'll put one loop line, which will probably bring about. Uh, 40 to 50, and then we build another one, we we'll bring another 100, and, and you basically step it up all up until you get to 200. The challenge is that um, it takes us about two to three years um, from FID to get to uh, BO. So therefore, decision needs to be taken um, soon. I, I know, um, uh, I think it was Yako talking about uh, in four months time, we need to make decision. I think from an infrastructure point of view, we needed to make that decision as, 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 as early as last year or as late as last year. So the quicker we uh, we move, uh, the better from our side because we want to follow the, the project schedule to the T because so that we do not um, compromise the integrity of the asset. So these are the, this is Romco basically as, as, as we are looking at today as well in the future that where we are, we're able to basically move the capacity and double the current capacity to 400 petajoules. And I think we're also looking at the possibility of, as I mentioned earlier on, of putting virtual pipeline to assist areas that are a bit far from the pipeline, but also to benefit from, from, from this resource. And 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 this the the, the, the next part of my uh, presentation, it I want to talk about. And um, the risk, and this is basically where I'm ending the conversation, but I want us to, as, as this is the takeaway, whether we finalize some of the conversation today or 
is the discussion that you must have in, in your own spaces because these are the realities that are facing us. So if you're looking at the ROM core, when, when it was from um, firstly established, we had to inject from one end and we had to take off from the other end. We had one tariff. It worked for everyone. But the gas industry in South Africa has evolved. So it evolved from a point where um, we had one big user of the gas and then that big user of the gas went into the market and started developing the gas industry and everyone started pe and, and pulling gas in South Africa as well in Mozambique. Therefore, we evolved in the space where we inject and then we have different takeoff. From a Rongo perspective, now we're moving into a space where we are going to have multiple injections in the pipeline and then we're going to have multiple tape take off in the pipeline. Therefore, it needs us to look at um, tariffs in a different way. So therefore, we, we've been engaging with the, uh, uh, the regulator, engaging and, and, and trying to explain that the old way of doing things or the old regime of way of doing things is not going to work in the future. So we need to look at tariffs where we're talking about distance adjusted tariffs. And, and, and the reason we want to bring this, we want to bring competition in terms of from the shippers' point of view, as well also at the, the end users, um, uh, we don't want them to be negatively impacted from the competition point of view. So that the tariff or the transportation cost does not really significantly impact the, the, the gas price itself. So these are the discussions that we have to have and and and, and align on with, 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 the, with the regulator itself. Time, it's very important um, on in any infrastructure development. Um, making those decisions um, um, is quite is quite important. Um, we need the industry to commit. And uh, as I mentioned, that will take us two to three years from FI, from FID, oh, sorry, yes, yeah, from FID to 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 basically uh, put the project um, at, 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 at play. So the earlier we make that decision and and, and the, the, the better, right? Our key challenge is that the, the gas price, I mean, we still have the issue that uh, if this gas, uh, if we put the infrastructure um, on the ground and the gas prices start to, to climb, um, and then we will then have, we will lose quite a lot of customers, meaning that that we're going to have this capacity that we've built, but then there is, is, is underutilized. And that's the risk that's sitting with us. And the, the, the difficulty for us, we cannot just go out there and, and build the infrastructure. We need to show, make sure that there's commitment or otherwise we'll put this uh, infrastructure and it will be underutilized and then it will then climb, the tariffs themselves will, will climb. I know no one wants to talk about this scenario, but this is the reality. We're talking about 2026. 2026 is a couple of months from here. Um, it's, we are 2024 um, and, and, and if we don't find a solution, we're going to find ourselves in a no go and no guess scenario. No guess scenario will all, from a Rongo perspective, we are we will have a pipeline that is underutilized because there will be limited gas that will be um, uh, uh, moving in there. But from a country side, we're talking about job losses, with, and job losses will, will climb anything between 200 to 400,000 job losses directly and indirect from our industry and other industry that um, are supporting us or we are feeding, we are the feed into. That's the reality that's feeding in. And if you look at the current today um, from a taxable revenue that the industry make, we talk about 450 billion rand, that will be negatively impacted if we have a no gas scenario. This is the reality that's facing us not from an industry perspective, but from a country perspective. So we have been having these conversations since 2018. We've been having these conversations and we knew about that 2024, we knew about 2026, but we need to make a decision and we need to commit. And the time is now. Um, thank you, Chris, um, uh, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much indeed uh, for those insights, um, Lanzani. Um, yeah, we've heard from gas users. We've heard from developers. We've heard from pipeline operators. 
And I think they're all saying the same message uh, that time for decisions is nigh. But before we uh, do anything further, let's hear from the voice of gas traders. Uh, and in particular, from Dion Glomo, who's the executive director of Quande Gas. Now, Dion founded Quande Group in 2004, and he's the executive director at Quande Petroleum and Quande Gas. And uh, they are involved in wholesale trading and supply of petroleum and gas products, as well as other energy commodities to commercial clients. He's also the executive director <coughs> of Quande Capital, which has investments in uh, energy infrastructure and related businesses. Dion started his career as a process engineer at the Shell and BP refineries and later joined McKinsey & Co. as a consultant. Over the years, Dion has focused on advising clients, trading commodities, and building businesses in the energy space. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Chemical Engineering and an MBA, both of them from the University of Cape Town. So uh, we're going to hear now a different perspective from the point of view of a trader uh, actively involved uh, in the KwaZulu-Natal area and other areas as well. So we're really looking forward to uh, he hearing from you and uh, over to you now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, here is my presentation showing. Perfectly. Thank you. Thanks, uh, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, and thanks for the introduction, Chris. Uh, maybe let me start by very briefly introducing uh, Gwanda Gas. You know, we are uh, an importer and a, a trader of Mozambican gas. Uh, we actually move uh, that gas through the Ronco pipeline that Nanzeli uh, uh, has just spoken about. Uh, we also uh, trade uh, some of that gas uh, to some of the industrial customers that uh, Yako uh, represents here. And uh, as, a, as a business, uh, we are actively looking at solutions uh, to bridge or to go beyond uh, uh, 2026, as has been uh, presented before. So. As Chris mentioned, our focus, you know, in this particular presentation is that uh, of a, a gas trader, and more specifically, probably as, a, as an aggregator. Uh, we had uh, put this presentation to cover three elements. Uh, the first two actually have been uh, covered quite a bit. I think uh, uh, Silas earlier spoke about uh, power and the importance of power in underpinning or importance of gas in underpinning power projects. Uh, Yako uh, made a very passionate uh, case uh, for, you know, the use or the, the role played by industrial users in, 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 in gas uh, demand. And, uh, and, and now we also had Yuri, you know, talking about one of the potential supply solutions. Uh, there are a few others that we may just highlight, but there is a third element around aggregation, which is a concept around pooling uh, gas demand to make uh, these type of uh, projects uh, uh, feasible. And that's what we want to uh, uh, spend a bit of time on. So I'll just give a very high level, you know, summary in, in terms of, uh, you know, the gas market. And I think um, uh, these are some of the studies that we've done, you know, looking at current consumption of gas and, and potential gas going forward. So we believe uh, that there is potential of uh, up to about 800 petajoules per annum of gas uh, utilization in this country. And this is based on the existing power, which is, uh, you know, using uh, the SADI pickers that are using other forms of energy. So this is needing to be converted. Potential power that has been announced, uh, you know, or various stages of uh, development of study. Uh, you know, car power also coming into this feedstock. I know people ask about whether Sasol is part of the picture or not, you know, but if you, you will say that currently they, they are a gas user and they're potentially uh, a, a, an entity that can procure gas. And there's also more survey there, which obviously currently mothballed, but uh, with gas, uh, 
uh, available, you know, the, it still demand, it still uh, remains, um, you know, a potential user of gas. And then obviously, uh, uh, the industrial users, we call it existing non-power and potential power. But I think one distinction that we also want to make in this is that uh, about 450 petajoules of these seats in the regions where there already exists some type of pipeline infrastructure to, you know, to move the molecules around. Um, so that would be Kaled and Pumalanga and Gauden. And then if you look at uh, Saldana, Mosabe and Goha, uh, there is no pipeline infrastructure yet, but there are plans, obviously, you know, if you look at uh, studies into the future in, in, in uh, connecting up some of those regions. So that's very high level on, you know, the gas demand. And I think, you know, maybe just looking at that again in a, in a slightly different uh, scale, you know, power uh, contributes about uh, 67% or so of uh, demand, uh, which is uh, uh, to be expected, which is still being quite high. But I think the, the focus, you know, as you see later on, is a red uh, block, which is uh, the industrial users currently um, you know, estimated at about, uh, well, currently it's 62, but with a potential of about 20 uh, in the Western Cape and, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, uh, in the Eastern Cape. This is actually not different based on some studies we've looked at from McKinsey and so forth in, in how the rest of the, uh, the world utilizes gas, uh, you know, in the various sectors. Um, you know, their focus, you know, gas remains about uh, 40 percent, uh, you know, utilized in, uh, in, 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 sorry, power remains about 40 percent uh, utilizing gas. And obviously, the, the only distinction we have there is that we don't have much gas in buildings uh, as well as transport. But in terms of the picture, in terms of the share, you know, power, which is the point that we want to make. Um, remains a big contributor towards making uh, underpinning uh, gas uh, utilization. Uh, switching over to to supply, you know, uh, and you know we've spoken quite a bit about you know uh, the the project in Matola. There are obviously a few other projects in South Africa that have been looked at or have been currently looked at. We've heard of uh, some, you know, onshore indigenous gas, Renegen and Kanatiko. We've heard about uh, gas drilling in the in the Orange Basin, which is uh, providing potential, you know, long term uh, 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 future supply uh, for this country. But of uh, immediate importance is obviously the projects that uh, are being looked at around LNG importation. But of you know being Matola and more recently being uh, Richards Bay, obviously as a trader we like to have gas uh, that um, would be available soonest, and uh, uh, if uh, Matola is there quicker, uh, you know we we are very very keen uh, to to actually get there. So I'm not going to go into detail of this slide. I think you just done a much better uh, description of this uh, in terms of the Matola uh, project. Um, there, there is a recent uh, TPL OPEC, which has been a project, which is also similar concept, but uh, maybe a slightly different construct that has been announced. And this is basically what they put out as what they're trying to do, essentially putting an FSRU in Richards Bay uh, with timelines 2028, 2029, somewhere there. But uh, the point is, we are starting to see infrastructure um, you know, projects looking at uh, bridge, bridging this gap or filling the demand that we've just shown, you know, in the past. Question maybe on this, you know, I've also seen somewhere in the Q and A's people asking whether can we can South Africa afford both of these projects? Uh, certainly, we do believe that uh, the country can afford that, given the numbers that we've just shown. Uh, obviously, the critical thing becomes uh, timing. Uh, and, the, the type of infrastructure uh, investments that have to be done to enable, you know, each of these projects. And, uh, but uh, as, as a trader, the more gas the merit. Uh, and uh, we do believe that. So switching over to, you know, to, to aggregation, and I, I'll take some liberty maybe just to, 
share a few developments. So the way we look at LNG business models uh, around the world, you have at the high end, uh, you know, the producers. These are typically large upstream companies, uh, which are uh, integrated or companies, national oil companies. Uh, they prospect and find best discoveries. They monetize these large discoveries by investing liquefaction capacity. And, um, you know, it's a space that is, you know, uh, requires huge capital uh, investments and it's generally a space where, you know, like one that guess or, you know, most of the people around this table actually probably wouldn't want to enter into. You then have uh, what we would call global traders or portfolio companies, you know, companies take up positions in these liquefaction plants. They typically have a huge, uh, yeah. They typically have a huge reach uh, in terms of uh, sales and marketing, and uh, they optimize basically their positions in liquefaction plants and the, 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 the access or the shots they have in the, in the downstream market. And, and I'll, I will cover some of this later on uh, as, as, uh, in terms of how they are starting to trade. But importantly, they are also facilitators uh, and uh, these facilitators tend to be independent trade and finance organizations, and, you know, shipping companies, and their role is really to support and facilitate trade, uh, moving LNG uh, from one point to the other, coming up with financial instruments to enable LNG, you know, sellers to connect with LNG buyers uh, in different parts of the globe and managing all the volatility and the issues that uh, happen in between. As you move down to the purchasers, you then have uh, large purchasers, and, and that's uh, typically when you see LNG projects, these will be large utilities with scale, in some cases, consortiums of utility, and they tend to enter into very long-term contracts, and you know their pricing is probably something similar to what uh, Yuri was uh, speaking about earlier, where you are indexing the, the LNG uh, molecule to oil and uh, now also starting to see indexing to other you know uh, hubs and hub and so forth. Um, but lastly and not uh, least will be in LNG term what you call uh, small purchasers because these are industrial users. These are people who use gas for not for power but for for the meal that uh, we actually showed earlier. And the the solutions that we are trying to 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 you know to bring into this table probably affect this particular segment more than any other. And these uh, players they don't have enough scale uh, to enter into very long term contracts, and they typically are very focused on the, running their own businesses. They don't really have uh, uh, access to global gas markets and. This is exactly where you know a player like a, an aggregator <clears throat> uh, plays a much bigger role in you know uh, linking up these type of players uh, with uh, you know the LNG supply and so forth. So summarizing this, maybe putting it in a you know different scale. You know, uh, on one side you have large scale and long term. Uh, you know, uh, there's a smaller scale and long term at the bottom. Uh, upstream and downstream. So on the top end, that's typically a pair of the in integrated oil companies, national oil companies, portfolio companies, as well as obviously large utilities. But our, obviously our focus is around this, you know, the small uh, scale and shorter term users, the industrial users where, you know, commodity traders as well as financiers play a much more significant role. So this maybe as a as a background is you know is uh, uh, we thought that uh, uh, will help uh, as an input to this uh, discussion. Now, when uh, trading LNG uh, now at the port, uh, generally you know we look at the type of commercial structures that uh, one can get into, um, uh, and uh, an LNG aggregator can obviously play in any different uh, commercial structure. But what we typically see is that the, the variations uh, are based on the amount of bundling that 
uh, happens in the project. And we ask the project developers choose particular ways that they want to, you know, present uh, uh, their solutions. You know, for instance, in the uh, Matola project, it's a, it's a bundle project where the LNG seller, the terminal company, and possibly now the, the power company, uh, well, in this case, probably outside of that as CTB, but there's a lot of bundling and then the, the, the you know, the, 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 the purchasers being power or industrial are basically outside of that. There's still a role that uh, an aggregator uh, plays there. And as you go down the, the scale, there is more unbundling, in, in which case we then have a lot of interfaces between the various, uh, uh, you know, parts of the value chain. Uh, 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 I'll just leave it there. But I think the point that I really want to make is that um, aggregation, whichever project or whichever structure that you're looking at is very critical uh, to project supply, to, to project success. And this is so because all of those players, be it an LNG supplier or be it a, you know, <clears throat> a terminal company, or, uh, they want not to have too many interfaces. They want to have uh, someone who can guarantee the offtakes they don't want to have, you know, 200 contracts or 200 SPAs as, a, as, a, as an SPA, as an LNG provider. They don't want to have, you know, multiple terminal use agreements. An LNG aggregator basically plays that particular role. And this is a role that, uh, you know, in most projects that we've seen around the world, um, uh, underpins or becomes critical in delivering, uh, you know, this type of projects. And in this particular case, probably it's more suited to or what we put in there was, um, you know, the example using uh, uh, Richards Bay, but it can equally apply, uh, you know, with uh, uh, some of the boxes obviously being uh, uh, bundled or put uh, differently uh, in the Matola project. Um, and I think, uh, you know, those slides will obviously be, you know, be available later on uh, for people to go into much more detail. But maybe just to spend uh, a few minutes on, on the benefits to both power and industrial users, I think, and, and I'll focus largely on industrial customers because that's the market that we serve greatly. You know, we, you know, aggregation, uh, you know, brings the economies of scale and, 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 and diversification of supply. Um, uh, which obviously lowers uh, the energy costs for you know for for, for the users and uh, um, so instead of uh, buying as one, you buy as a group and uh, uh, realizing some cost savings. Um, reliable energy supply. We, we, we obviously you know with reliable uh, with robust uh, SPAs with LNG suppliers, uh, one is able to actually uh, improve and give you a rated energy supply there. Um, traders, which is typically your LNG aggregators, they also play, uh, participate in various financial instruments and energy strategies to, to manage price volatility. And in this market, and we've seen lately that the LNG market has been uh, um, affected quite heavily by volatility. And, uh, and uh, given how LNG is traded today, risk management uh, is, is very, very key. And um, uh, aggregators and vis-a-vis -vis, uh, traders, they generally handle this aspect of business uh, quite well, uh, part of what they do day to day. Um, not true in all pro uh, 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 projects, but the, you know, uh, in many markets, uh, aggregators are able to to, to, to have a variety of uh, supply contracts and, uh, and therefore uh, uh, bring that flexibility um, in, 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 into you know, the offering of their customers and, and with flexibility that's always good. But also, you know, lastly, you know, at the end of the day, aggregators are traders and, they, uh, and they're in the market. So there is a lot of technical and regulatory support that they still uh, offer uh, to industrial customers. Power, um, you know, there are also advantages for them, but I, I will, you know, maybe just uh, uh, 
uh, squeeze through this uh, because I also don't want to take too much of your time. Um, you know, but it's uh, very much the, 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 the you know, cognitive energy supplies, project financing, because those power projects, they tend to rely uh, heavily on, uh, uh, you know, reaching, uh, you know, having some uh, proper agreements put in place for project finance. And, uh, you know, this is where an aggregator solution can also be handy because we are not aggregating for power, but we're also bringing volume for the other uh, parts uh, uh, of customers. Um, I will not read that slide, slide, slide by slide, but uh, then looking into what does an aggregator uh, actually do on the day to day, you know, and this is, you know, as I move towards my last slides, yeah. Um, so uh, an aggregator will commit to uh, an LNG annual contract quantity, uh, generally known as an ACQ, but also importantly, a take or pay. And these become very critical for an LNG supplier uh, to take, uh, and in most cases, the terminal uh, uh, operator, uh, developer as well, to take the project forward. You know, they will typically commit uh, to daily quantities that have to be uh, shipped out of the facility, what we call regasified LNG, uh, trying to smooth that particular curve so that uh, LNG inventory can be uh, managed properly. Uh, they will commit to you know, an annual delivery program, you know, uh, which can also be broken down into much shorter term timelines, a 90-day schedule, and they always annual payments to you know, LNG cargo deliveries, providing cargo, uh, credit support, you know, making payments to terminal concession and uh, and uh, lease and operating payments to you know to the FSRE. So as you can tell, you know, they really become um, the wheels, or you know, or you know, in, in actually moving this particular chain beyond, uh, uh, you know, let's say its uh, implementation, but also in ex execution. Um, some thoughts around, you know, things that are happening uh, around LNG trading because it becomes, probably brings in, uh, you know, different uh, perspectives uh, as we look into a world of LNG because South Africa hasn't really been in the space. Uh, uh, you know, markets are getting more globally interconnected, you know, uh, trading in real time and uh, they're automated. But also, there's a huge drive around environmental transition, which is giving rise to alternative commodities away from gas. And uh, and, uh, and and that's a reality that uh, uh, as traders and users of gas have to be uh, cognizant of. You know, so there is rapid growth, um, price volatility shifts in, in how uh, trades are happening. Uh, aggregators and portfolio companies are starting to play a much bigger role in energy trade. In the past, it used to be one-on-one -on -one contracts between the national oil companies or the integrated oil companies and the end users. What you are seeing now is that there is a different type of player who basically aggregates these markets and, and, and uh, contracts for those particular projects. There's also an increase in short-term transactions and transport trading, obviously, with that. Uh, comes volatility. I think in the when LNG started, um, most of the transactions were contract based. Qatar will, will contract with uh, South Africa, and the contract will be there for fifty years. Now we see, you know, uh, LNG essentially being uh, commoditized and uh, uh, trading on a real time basis or spot trading it has its uh, pros, but it also has its uh, Negatives, as we saw in the Russian-Ukraine war, and the LNG prices uh, shooting through the roof. Um, but also, this particular evolution is starting to be to bring different types of contracts, you know, that uh, are in commercially that are moving away uh, from your know, features that were, you know, presented or, or, or imposed by producers, such as very long-term commitments and so forth. And uh, we, are still, we are starting to see uh, standardization that is moving away from, from, from the traditional uh, form of contracting. 
as I close, I do want to leave you with some thoughts, uh, you know, beyond LNG. And I think part of the question that I've seen here is, you know, what role do we actually see uh, natural gas playing in a decarbonizing world? And I think uh, various studies do foresee that at some point gas will peak. And I think one study I saw spoke about uh, LNG peaking around 2046. Um, if you are looking at uh, you know uh, a case of many, uh, maintaining 1.5 degree climate change scenario so that's still you know a few years ahead uh, uh, you know and, and obviously those are global estimates and things do shift uh, but it's you know some thoughts that we just need to 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 you know uh, always to be cognizant of as we are, as we are uh, looking at the role as an industry that we play in next decarbonizing world Energy efficiencies, I think obviously everyone is uh, trying to improve energy efficiency. At some point, this may drive demand away and uh, reduce gas demand. Uh, you know, we, uh, in the short term or medium term, obviously, that's not necessarily the case, but uh, at some point, actually, Europe has already uh, started to see some fall of demand uh, due to energy efficiencies or technological advancement. But I think closer to home, you know, in the fullness of time, you know, uh, is South Africa a net importer or a net exporter of gas? Um, and it has implications on what facilities do you want to develop here? Do you want to uh, put in, um, you know, liquefaction plants if you find gas in the Karoo and uh, Orange Basin and export it? Do you want to put regasification terminals uh, along our coast? And, and uh, does it really matter? Because, I mean, the U.S. went through this uh, and uh, they were a net importer of gas and they are now a net exporter and they've driven through that way uh, uh, quite eloquently. Uh, so maybe it actually doesn't matter. But those are the thoughts that I just thought that we will leave you with as we uh, close this discussion. Uh, thanks, Chris. Well, thank you very much indeed, Dion, uh, for those insights of the uh, challenges facing uh, traders and also the value-adding benefits that traders bring, especially for the uh, smaller industrial gas users, <coughs> which is also a main subject of, of today's uh, presentation. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're running about 10 to 15 minutes over time. Uh, but uh, I've asked uh, Wayne Glossop from the South African IPP Association and also a consultant uh, to do a wrap up. And Wayne, if I could ask you to uh, keep it as short as possible because of this time overrun. But just to introduce him, Wayne is a management committee member of uh, the South African IPP Association. And he's also an independent power project uh, development advisor with a focus on the gas IPP sector in Southern Africa. He's been in the energy business development for 15 years, working on gas, solar, battery, coal, and hybrid energy projects, with the majority of his time spent as regional sales director for Wartzilla, focusing on the gas to power sector. Wayne is well versed in the challenges and opportunities within the regional power sector, and is passionate about driving positive change towards a sustainable and load shedding free society. Uh, Wayne is a registered uh, professional engineer with a master's degree in power engineering from Wits University and an MBA from the Henley Business School. Uh, over to you, Wayne, uh, for a few words of wrap up. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, and very interesting presentations. Um, it's uh, it, It's been there's a clear theme that time has run out. Uh, it's not running out, it has run out, uh, judging by the, th the four months gap that was shown by uh, by, by Yaku on his, on his slide deck. Um, and, and it's clear that the gas sector has probably been the victim of um, a, a, a governmental inertia over the years. It's really struggled since I've been part of the industry. It's really, I've seen it struggle to get off the ground. There's been many times where gas to power initiatives have kind of gone down the runway, gathered speed, but not actually got the wheels off the ground. Um, but but hopefully the pressure that the country's seen with the gas cliff coming up, uh, we'll see it turn around in 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 this uh, this crisis that 
that, that we're going to be facing quite soon. I'm not going to reflect. I, I I had notes on all the presentations and and my I'm meant to reflect on all the presentations, but I'm going to cut straight to a couple of key points given the time constraints, because I, I think there's, there's been a lot of talk on gas, and you know we probably all now can be called or classified gas experts or LNG experts after what we've heard from from our uh, speakers early today. Um, but as a power guy who's developing gas power plants, um, it, it's you know the, the biggest challenge I see is that you're talking about merging two very distinct different worlds. You, you're trying to merge a, a gas world to a power world. And what the gas world wants is nice, big, juicy volumes of gas to be pumping through at a nice constant rate. But what the power world wants from gas is, or at least every power system study that I've seen, it says, hey, renewables is the cheapest. Uh, gas, we like you, but you've got to just help the renewables. So you've got this absolute opposite uh, view of gas. They both like gas power, um, but one likes it only when required and one likes it to be going full time all the time. And, and I think the answer is somewhere in the balance in there. And, you know, we've been talking about gas supplies um, the, the, the whole morning now, but oh, afternoon rather. Um, what about the PPAs? You know, Silas started off his discussion saying, you know, we'll sign the PPA. Come to come to government. We'll we'll we've got the government guarantees. We'll provide the sovereign guarantees and offtakes for the gas power. And we've heard the repeating theme that gas power is the anchor for these these big gas infrastructure projects. Um, but that's that's where the challenge is. And we're actually sitting now with the gas IPP program having been launched uh, just before Christmas last year by the IPP office, and. The question I have is, is that the answer to really kickstart and initiate all this gas infrastructure that we need? Um, so let me give a, a few thoughts around, around that gas IPP program. Um, just in summary, it calls for two gigawatts of gas projects of between 300 and one gigawatt uh, anywhere in the country. Uh, it limits the number of megawatts in Richard Spade to a thousand megawatts. Um, and basically projects have to come already quite well advanced in their development with the gas supply solution. Now, realistically, we're talking about either a Richards Bay terminal or a Matola uh, supply uh, uh, that can meet potentially or theoretically meet the timelines required by this gas IPP program. Um, the, the program also calls for power generators to be of mid merit, uh, so 40 to 65 percent. But so that that's sort of a balance in our, how, how I see it of maybe not giving uh, the, uh, the full baseload uh, requirement to a gas offtake, uh, but it's a relatively high gas offtake compared to what the system operator should theoretically, and I say theoretically carefully because, of course, we've got to realize that we are in a power system with an ailing coal fleet and at least whilst that coal fleet is um, uh, struggling, uh, there, there's a high chance that higher coal or gas capacity factors are going to be needed to supplement the, the coal fleet. Um, how long is that going to last for? We don't know. Maybe 5, 10, 20 years, we don't know. But at some point, gas should be playing a more backup supporting role to, to renewables. Now, I, I guess the, the, the some of the, you know, getting feedback from, from various players within our association um, on the on the IPP program, uh, it, it's clear that they do want advanced projects. And, and I guess the biggest challenge is they want projects with a, a completed EIA. So I did a quick search, uh, public information, and by the end of last year, you could see that there was only actually six power plant EIA authorizations in the country that could theoretically qualify, uh, maybe through amendments or something, but that, that could theoretically qualify, uh, qualify for, for the gas IPP program. At least half of those have a critical fatal flaw of grid access. So, you know, by the end of last year, there was actually only three EIAs that can comply uh, with the requirements of the tender. Um, and I, th I think this is probably the biggest concern for interested parties in this program is, well, um, you know, you're asking for, for a full env or environmental authorization. Um, 
you know, more time is needed. So the bid closes on the end of August. Uh, of course, an EIA would take more than, say, eight or nine months to complete. So so that that's something that I think probably government might need to just think about and, and see how they can accommodate uh, to get more than three bids um, into a competitive bidding process. Um, but nevertheless, so, you know, also what I've heard uh, feedback from this gas IPP program, it's clear that no one is happy. And I, I think, you know, my reading of this program, it's, it's the ultimate um, balance or compromise you know, they say that a negotiation, you know, it's a successful negotiation when no one walks away completely satisfied. And I, th that's what I read into this. The, the gas suppliers are not going to be completely satisfied. The um, investors are not going to be completely satisfied. The lawyers are going to get scared of some of the things. The, the developers are going to be scared of some of the things, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but, but hopefully uh, the, the IPP office and DLMRE have sort of slapped bang this project in the middle of an area that can be worked on and and that will will make projects happen in the end. And, and I, I think the um, request from the IPP side is that government uh, takes learnings from previous programs, uh, most particularly the, the, the risk mitigation program, where we saw a couple of gas projects not coming to fruition there. Uh, let's take those learnings and let's put them into this gas program. Uh, the last thing you want is another program, failed program. I mean, that's going to be the ultimate confidence killer uh, for investors in the South African gas power sector. Um, so definitely work cut out for, for everyone playing in the space. Uh, it's going to be an exciting time. This is an exciting opportunity uh, to, to realize these gas power anchors. Uh, but I think we're all going to have to be a little bit flexible and understanding of each other's positions to actually make something happen in the space. So I think let me draw a conclusion there, uh, Chris. I gave eight minutes there. Hopefully we save some time uh, for Q&A. Uh, thank you so much, Wayne. Yeah, you brought an interesting perspective uh, focusing on gas to power uh, and, 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 and some of the realities that need to uh, be addressed in that sector. Uh, sometimes we are optimistic in one direction or another or over pessimistic in another direction or other. And uh, somewhere in the middle, maybe, just maybe, will be the ground where we uh, find some solutions. I, I, I certainly uh, hope there will be some solutions, certainly to the gas cliff, as well as to the uh, power supply needs of South Africa. But it's a pleasure now to introduce to you uh, Daryl Hunt. Uh, Daryl is going to field the Q&A, and we haven't got a lot of time left for the Q&A, but maybe we can carry on a little bit for those who want to. Uh, we are going to end at uh, 2.30, but uh, I think if it's possible, we'll just carry on uh, and understand that some people will have to leave uh, and apologize for the delays, uh, but it's been a fantastic discussion so far. Anyway, Daryl worked at Shell for 15 years in various positions, including the uh, business development at the Kudu Gas Project in Namibia, and as commercial manager for the Kucha LNG to Power Project at Kucha. Uh, and at the end of 2006, he joined Eskom's Generation Division, division for a short while, responsible for gas and renewable projects, after which he set up Dynamic Energy Consultants, uh, who advise on projects in South Africa, Mozambique, Namibia, Botswana, Ghana, Ivory Coast, Sudan, and Lebanon even, covering uh, indigenous upstream gas, LNG sale and purchase, uh, gas pipelines, gas-based and floating LNG import terminals, liquid fuels infrastructure and power generation opportunities, including gas to power and renewables. Daryl holds a master's degree in economics. And I just want to say that I consider to be Daryl to be one of the country's uh, most respected uh, experts in the gas sector. I often uh, give him a call and or drop him a note uh, to get answers on some issues that are troubling me. And he's always extremely helpful. And uh, Daryl, it's a pleasure to have you here uh, and to to field the Q and A. I hope you've been listening to the looking at the questions. There's been quite a lot of them, but I think you're going to summarise some of them and pose uh, a few of these questions uh, to one or other of the panel. If I can ask all the panelists to please switch on your uh, videos at the moment so we can see you. Uh, Daryl will then uh, pose a question and field it and ask and uh, one of the um, uh, presenters. Uh, to uh, to respond to it. We can see Yako there. 
I don't see anybody else's cameras on. Uh, but, uh, oh, yes, there's Dion. <laughs> Thank you, Dion. And there is Yuri. And there is Wayne. Uh, yeah, we've got a fantastic, and um, um, London, uh, Manzani, we've got a fantastic lineup of uh, of experts here. Uh, so, uh, uh, Daryl, it's over to you now to field some questions. Uh, please just carry on until uh, the necessary. Uh, we'll go beyond uh, uh, 2.30 if people can stay on, but we understand if they have to drop off. Over to you, Daryl. Chris, thanks very much for that complimentary uh, introduction. I owe some of the accolades to actually some of the folks on this uh, webinar today. Uh, they were my line managers and colleagues at uh, various stages of my career. Um, I'm going to go straight away and go to really where, and, and a comment was made that gas is a demand response. It's not a supply push. So let me go straight to our customers in this webinar, and that's our um, our large industrial users, and then also the smaller customers that are serviced by by, by traders. And and I'm going to ask Yaku the question specifically on affordability uh, and the alternative. Let's remember for context of this uh, webinar, we're talking about the gas cliff on the one hand, we're talking about powered future power demand on the other hand, and the potential synergies uh, that exist between these two situations. So the question is, can the existing industrial markets, CNI markets, afford the alternative, which is LNG? And if you could maybe um, add some comments on what potentially or how could uh, future power demand contribute to enhancing that affordability uh, equation? Thanks, Daryl. We, we recently completed a very important survey and and I think before I get into those details, one, one needs to make a distinction between domestic gas and LNG, right? The, the domestic gas, of course, has the benefit of cost pricing, et cetera, where LNG is a global commodity. South Africa at this juncture will transition uh, towards LNG until there's sufficient domestic gas available and then would transition uh, potentially back to, to domestic gas subject to availability. The survey... The survey that we referred to <clears throat> spoke about the affordability of LNG. Now, I don't want to go into the specific price levels, but what we see is that even with that shift, everyone takes pain, right? So the, the pertinent question we asked is, how will price impact your business and how will no gas impact your business? On the pricing front, what we see converting all of that to volume and, and, and so on. We see certain sectors actually getting out of gas and actually cutting back production um, and, and, and descaling operations, unfortunately. We see other sectors being able to even absorb that cost and pass it on through to consumers and customers. Everyone's got unique market dynamics. Um, and we actually see sectors needing more gas which, which is interesting because it, it talks to the energy shortfall elsewhere, you know, whether it's power, whether it's, you know, people are desperate just to get their hands on gas energy simply to stabilize, for example, own uh, or, or, or electricity supply with own power generation. When you, when you sum all of this at the end of the day, we see a, there's some swings and roundabouts, as I just explained. So if you sum all of that, I mean, the, the, the demand curve is actually quite flat, despite the, the, the um, differential in pricing. Is it, does, does it upset and disrupt business? Yes. Does it impact the economy of South Africa? Absolutely. Can we absorb it? In certain instances, yes. Other instances, no. So from a demand perspective, we actually see a flat curve uh, uh, going forward. Thank you. Thanks, Haku. If I may put some uh, words in your mouth. So there isn't really an alternative. Um, some questions were asked, can't we just use uh, HFO? Can't we use diesel? Um, there were questions around that. And I think you did allude to in your presentation the mere scale of that. Uh, we don't have the incremental uh, infrastructure to, to absorb that scale. And I think also what I hear you saying is there will be some measure of demand destruction at these higher price levels. But intrinsically, the demand curve is still there, and therefore it potentially needs some synergy or some interface with new markets to achieve the um, infrastructure 
uh, unit unit or economies of scale. And hence the emphasis in this presentation from several presenters about getting um, the throughput in the gas infrastructure, whether that's a gas pipeline or an LNG import is, facility. If, 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 if I can maybe just add to this, I mean, LNG is a global commodity, you know, and there's certain certain uh, contracts that you can enter into, certain indices, formulas, and so on and so forth. There's not much one can do there in terms of the volume and the scale that the South African market requires, even with power. Where the rubber hits the road is on infrastructure. And it is in that space where the developers and the investors need to have comfort that there will be sufficient throughput. It may start off at a certain level, but it certainly needs to have, like I said earlier, the runway lights on for, for, for increased demand. To And the more volume throughput you have through expensive infrastructure, of course, the, the less of the unit costs to all. Absolutely. Thanks, Yaku. That's helpful. And I think it helped give perspective to, to the participants of the, there is no alternative for these CNI markets, but they need power to bring their unit costs down. I think that's the, the summary. Um, if I may um, ask two questions to um, infrastructure uh, folks, um, and then also potentially on the LNG front, I'm going to pick on on you, uh, Yuri, and if I may as well, uh, on on. Um, Lanzani, one of the questions which was asked, which I think is important to touch on, is, is bankability. What defines a bankable offtake uh, and what defines a bankable gas transport agreement? What defines bankability? And, and if we are looking to private sector initiatives as offtakers, do we are we comfortable that we will have the required bankability criteria? So I'll leave the question there before introducing too much of the answer. <clears throat> Mlandezi, would you like to come in? Ah, yes. Yeah, I'll shoot first, um, Mlandezi, if you mind. Um, in terms of bankability, um, uh, Daryl, I think at the end of the day, the, the, the immediate short term is is the biggest challenge, i.e. the cash flow end of the, of the play rather than the return play. We can build all kinds of assumptions with regards to the future. We know that that the Mozambican market, which is an additional um, 30 odd pedigree, will need replacement sli slightly behind the South African market because of the priority that uh, Mozambique uh, enjoys. But it's coming. We know that there will be some gas to power, et cetera, but it might be delayed from the, the period at which um, um, the, the likes of the large CNI users require. So, firstly, it's solving that that cash flow crunch in the, in the in the early years and that could be all manner of things and we're, we're looking at all all the potential solutions whether there's patient capital solutions etc that can help us get there then the other side of that question of course when we talk about bankability that's that's the economics of the bankability um, technically i think we're there uh, all the other all the other options but the other side of course is what what support is required we are engaging the market on those on, on yep. those issues too, because there will be some some accredited support required. A bankable gas transport agreement, maybe a comment there. Um, thanks, Daryl. Um, I think Yuri touched on it. Here. I think it's the cash flow is number one um, from from the end users or for the from the shippers perspective. Uh, I think the most important part of uh, from a transport perspective is the sooner we have GSAs, which is a gas supply agreements that are signed between shippers and the and, and as well the gas owners. For us, that's good enough to start to kickstart the FID. But because yeah. we cannot really move on and 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 take FID if there is no GSAs that have been signed because then we will be building this infrastructure and this infrastructure will not be yeah. utilized at all. I think that's very really helpful. I think to make a point which I've made with several of you in various offline discussions, one mustn't forget how the gas industry came into being in South Africa. You know, Sassel took upstream risk on itself. Um, it took midstream risk in building Romco and it was its own market. And what we're seeing now, of course, with Sassel stepping away from the upstream, divesting in the midstream and saying it can't afford LNG in the downstream, is you're seeing those internalized risks within Sassel now 
externalized in the market. And so it's a new paradigm and it's a new reality. And these are the challenges we confronted with. So it's not only affordability issues, it's not only timing issues, it's also the balance sheets required to get across the finish line. So it's just a comment um, I wanted to make. Two slightly more technical questions, which I think were quite interesting and maybe not to spend too much time on it. Um, and I'm, I'm sure someone in the pipeline industry or maybe yourself, Dion, I'm not sure. But um, what? why not a direct pipeline between Matola and Richards Bay? And another question similar, why not a pipeline from Ruma to Matola? Anybody want to volunteer and answer on, on those two? And, and to keep it quick, because I've got one more question for Wayne, if I may. And I'm mindful, Chris, we've got two minutes. Maybe uh, let me let me take the Rovuma one. But uh, I think, uh, you know, certainly if you look at, uh, and I think Yako uh, just mentioned this, obviously, over time, pipe gas becomes a, a cheaper uh, it is a cheaper way to actually supply the market and uh, to the extent that one can get uh, domestic gas, uh, it, it helps the market, you know. Um, the Rovuma uh, pipeline, from my understanding, has been looked at in the past and I think there was a very uh, strong case uh, to link up those uh, finds up in the north uh, and, and, you know, uh, to the market here in, in Southern Africa. But uh, for some reason, you know, uh, there were not enough takers in terms of capex uh, to, to actually do it. It's a long pipeline, 2,000 kilometers, quite expensive. But uh, in the fullness of time, you know, probably if that was developed, uh, it would integrate this market quite well. Thank, thanks, Dion. Wayne, no, no, no. last question, Chris, or shall I... Um... No, you're on you're on mute, Chris. Uh, yes, please. Let's ask Wayne uh, the last question. Thank you. <laughs> last, last question, Wayne. Sorry, you're not going to get away, but I, I, you did remind us that uh, there was also the issue of a gas uh, procurement program, uh, and you defined quite eloquently some of the headline parameters. And, and I think you're right. You know, we tend to do least cost planning, um, which I say respectfully is a is a very much a spreadsheet environment. Um, ask any business developer about the realities of procuring grid infrastructure, ask a developer about the realities of procuring the hardware, about actually implementing projects, the ONM or specifically the EPC capability of the industry in South Africa. Do you think some measure of compromise might be needed to position gas more uh, eloquently as an insurance policy? in the event that our renewables ambitions are hamstrung by some of the market uh, and infrastructure realities they confronted with. So I, I, to your point about um, a suboptimum solution and both parties feel, hey, we could have got more out of it. My question is, would higher capacity factors and greater measures of predictability perhaps enhance a gas to power program as an insurance policy against challenges which renewables may yet be confronted with? Mm. Thanks, Daryl. I, I think that, you know, those models, those uh, theoretical power system models, they show that gas is just really just a backup to renewables. None of them take into account sort of real world risk. Uh, what if we can't build out renewables because of grid constraints at the pace we want to? What if uh, the coal fleet availability drops uh, far quicker than we planned? Uh, these are realities that, um, as a country, I don't think we should be gambling with. I think we should be planning a safety net, and and uh, I think the way to do that is with gas. Now the question is, well, okay, do you do you build these big gas plants with twenty year commitments, or do you start to now build in some kind of flexibility in that twenty year? Because I mean, it's twenty year BPA you're signing. Um, do you do you start to introduce some kind of triggers uh, to to accommodate the changing environment you're in. Um, of course, no one's going to be happy with that. Uh, you know, I, I'm sure the likes of, of Yuri or, or um, uh, Mlanzeni is not going to be happy if I say, all right, in five years' time as an IPP, I'm going to change my load factor from 70% down to 20%. Uh, you know, that, there's a premium to that, and, and that premium has got to be paid. Um, yeah. so, so I think these kind of commercial realities need to be understood and recognized um, in order for us to get energy security in the country. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think it's, and in closing, Chris, I think that's a critical, critical point. I mean, these commercial realities, um, it's a pity we don't have uh, lawyers or bankers on, on this uh, webinar because they will be the reality or the sanity check at the end. Uh, if, if you're going to have these opt-out uh, op options of every five years to modify, is that bankable? Uh, can, can that be done? Um, but it's an open question. It's not for us to answer here. Chris, uh, th thanks, Wayne. Chris, I'm mindful it's 2.30. So I guess at this point you want to officially close and uh, we're happy to stay around. Certainly I can, if required. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much, uh, everybody, uh, for a fantastic uh, panel discussion, fantastic uh, panelists and uh, presentations. It's been really an eye-opener. Uh, and I am going to draw it to a close now at 2.30, but, but for those that want to stay on, for those that can stay on, we're going to take a few more questions by means of the hands up facility uh, on Zoom. So if uh, we're going to officially close now, thank you very much, everybody. But we're going to carry on and uh, I'm going to ask you to put up your hands. Um, Ian, can you go back to that panel? Yeah, thank you, because we are going to continue uh, for those that can stay on. If there's anybody who want to put up their hands and ask a question, please do so. I see a question. I see two hands up at the moment, and I'm going to hand the mic uh, to Michelle uh, Rivarola, uh, and I'm going to allow you to talk now. Uh, if you can please switch on your mic and ask your question, Michelle. Hi. Um, I just have a couple of questions. Uh, I hear please, please, everybody's. Please, uh, please keep it. Please keep it very short, Michelle. We, we yeah. time is limited, and one question, please. Yeah, uh, everybody's saying that gas is a low carbon option, which it actually isn't. If you look at the uh, whole life cycle of gas from extraction, accounting for fugitive emissions and so on, it's actually probably worse than coal. But be that as it may, you are talking about investing huge amounts of money in infrastructure to convey a fluid, which maybe in 10 years time you will not be able to use. Uh, because exporters won't be able to export if they are charged carbon excise duties by their customers and they have to use some other type of uh, energy source. Now, have, has anybody actually looked at uh, building infrastructure that can be used to convey, for example, hydrogen? Because you can transport gas in hydrogen lines. You can't transport hydrogen in gas lines because of material issues. Uh, that's the question that I have. And, you know, financial institutions are coming under huge pressure from their shareholders to actually duck out completely of the fossil fuel industry. And it's a fact. And if you don't acknowledge that, well, you might find yourself with no financials at the end of the day. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. Let's uh, pose this question to Wayne. Uh, Wayne, would, would you like to respond to this? I know it's a, it's a difficult one, but I, I think you're... <laughs> You, you you know a lot about the subject. Uh, you know the carbon emissions resulting from the whole gas supply chain. Are they worse mm. than coal or not? And um, what is the reality about stranded assets as a result of uh, increasing uh, carbon taxes and co uh, cross border adjustment mechanisms? Mm. Uh, thanks. It's it's a valid valid set of questions, uh, Michelle. And um, the the carbon. Um, Comparison to coal, uh, to be honest, I, I haven't studied that in, in depth, the whole value chain, and I, I'm not personally convinced, but let me not uh, make comment on that until I've actually seen the facts and figures behind that. So let me let me not address that one specifically. But I think your point about sort of the energy transition and the concern about investors is, is a real concern, absolutely. And, um, you know, the... the, 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 the not the trick. It's not, not. It's not the right word. But um, the approach that the gas sector needs to be adopting and embracing more is the energy transition and the you know things like green hydrogen. Green hydrogen is one of a number of green fuels. But uh, let's just talk about green hydrogen for now. Uh, being hydrogen capable, I think, is a key element. Um, so, for example, if an IPP is developing a power plant project using natural gas today. Uh, it would be prudent of them to ensure that that gas power plant could at some point be converted to green hydrogen in the future. And, and I think a lot of the technology providers out there are developing their, their engines and their turbines to, to accommodate that transition. Um, 
Of course, the economics when when that switch have switchover happens is is probably the biggest question. Um, you know, is it five? Is it ten? Is it fifteen years where a green hydrogen solution could be more viable than a natural gas? That's that's up for debate, and there's a lot of um, uh, confusion yeah. out there on that topic. But it's a very valid point, uh, not an easy one to address, and one that that um, uh, as IPPs we we constantly challenge to, you know, provide energy security for South Africa today with a fossil fuel, uh, but also recognize that the world is on this energy transition, South Africa included, and we have to be developing projects that can accommodate. Uh, a, a green, cleaner, uh, carbon-free future. So, yeah, thanks for bringing that point up. Very, very valid uh, points. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Wayne. And yeah, I think it's something for the gas industry must really start thinking about: is the uh, carbon emissions from the burning of, of, of gas, uh, looking at the whole uh, supply chain. If they haven't thought about it already, they really should be thinking about it now, uh, because I think it's a it's a valid question uh, that bears an answer. I'm not saying what the answer should be, but I see one last hands up, uh, and if I'm going to take this one, uh, it will be definitely the last question. Martin uh, Solomon, uh, your hand is up. I'm allowing you to talk. Uh, please switch on your microphone and ask your question, but and direct it to one of the presenters, please. Yes, hi, Chris. Can you hear me? We can. Thank you. Yeah, so if I may, I, I actually want to make three observations uh, and I whoever wishes Keep to respond short, no I'll, I'll, short, I'll do so I, I think the first observation is that you know if we want to move away from hydrocarbons we need to understand that we need to displace in the period that we're talking about about 150 million barrels of oil equivalent which includes gas I mean that's a hundred years worth of capital investment so it's a material uh, challenge. The second observation that I want to make is one around LNG. Uh, I've listened to this. I've worked in the LNG industry for a long time. And I think there's, there are immense misconceptions about the LNG industry. Firstly, LNG pricing is a contracted negotiated pricing mechanism still by absolute preference. It's not a spot-based industry. And I think, I think the sector or this energy sector in South Africa needs to appreciate that. And as I observed, I mean, the energy LNG pricing differs fundamentally by market and by client. There is no consistent pricing, even on a contracted basis. And I think South Africans generally misunderstand that. The last observation that I want to make is that South Africa needs to understand that it is competing for supply of energy into this economy, whether that is for LNG delivery, or whether that is for development of regional resource. And we need to be more strategic rather than transactional in the way that we position for the interests of players who can actually answer our ask. So uh, I've said a lot, but, uh, but I am a bit concerned at the depth of discussion uh, that I encounter on these subjects. But yeah. thanks, thanks for entertaining me. Thank you, Martin, Chris, for those us, comments. I? I, I see, I see one last hand up, and I cannot resist uh, uh, that uh, Silas uh, would like to say something. Uh, and I'm trying to find where you are with your hands up, Silas, because I can see your hand is up. Ah, I'm saying, I'm asking you to unmute. Uh, yeah, please ask your question. Switch on your mic and ask your question. Thank yeah, you. no, no, thanks, thanks, Chris, um, and thanks for the participants. I think it, it was a good uh, webinar, uh, Chris, and uh, I actually enjoyed listening to the speakers, the experts, but I think we, we, we all have gaps in between our roles, and, and we seem to be saying we are interdependent, but we're not specifying as to the how. So there's a, a more of such discussions that are needed. There is definitely a demand, but as to how we get this gas to South Africa has not been answered. The tariff has not been answered, but the you know the 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 gas to power program. I think it's it's official now. It's out. Let's leave it to close and see if there's responses. We're all watching it. We're getting concerns, but there are also those that are saying we are ready. So I don't know what to say on that one. But uh, um, the, we still see the, the gas to power as a part of the, the just energy transition. 
but I think I've learned a lot from the experts on, on what has to happen on the infrastructure that would need to be rolled out, the capital investment that is huge and cannot be ignored. Uh, and I, I really appreciate being part of this, Chris. That's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you, Silas, indeed. And, uh, you know, you talked about the uh, gas to power program, the IPP gas to power program. A big problem that I have with it is the most viable project that seems to be on the table, which is the Matola project that Yuri is talking about, is excluded from this program. Uh, and that worries me uh, because it is the most viable, the shortest term option. Uh, there is, uh, you know, a grid connection available in the form uh, of, of the uh, of the power lines, uh, you know, from uh, Mozambique through Swaziland or Eswatini to South Africa, uh, and and, uh, and 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 it is spade ready, but it is excluded. Okay, I've got that off my chest. <laughs> uh, look, I'm going to just uh, ask Daryl to just say a few words because he was the facilitator, uh, and just say some words of conclusion. If you can switch your mic on, Daryl, uh, and uh, one or you know, half a minute for you. <laughs> yeah, thanks. I mean, for me, the business case for gas in South Africa is compelling. Um, I know there are some folks who say we need to embrace um, we, or we need to reject uh, any new fossil fuel opportunities. I think that is what we aspire towards. That's our vision of where we want to be. But we've got a long way to go yet. Even Europe is still embracing uh, new LNG, new gas projects to secure its energy future uh, security. So I think the business case and the market opportunity for natural gas in South Africa uh, based on power generation is compelling. We're seeing 15 gigawatts of coal falling off the system, depending on whether it's retired or just not, not functional anymore by 2035 or thereabouts or a bit later. That's going to be difficult to fill purely with batteries and solar panels and wind turbines. We're going to need as much as we can get our, lay our hands on. I'm talking about the renewables projects. We're going to need everything we can do. And gas will also be part of what we need to achieve. No, that's, that's my view. Thank you. Thank you, Daryl. Uh, it's, it's a controversial subject. It's an interesting subject. I've learned a lot. I hope you've learned a lot too. Uh, thanks to our presenters. Thanks to the sponsors, uh, the people that came together and made this possible. It's been a wonderful uh, uh, you know, afternoon uh, engaging uh, with you all uh, uh, you know, from a diverse uh, range of, uh, of, of, of enterprises you know, from, uh, from the Industrial Gas Users Association um, uh, through through to uh, you know gas pipeline operators uh, through to uh, uh, traders uh, you know and 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 also developers uh, you know of real uh, projects. So wonderful to hear from you. Thanks for joining us. We look forward to the next webinars uh, and uh, watch the space. Uh, there's plenty more coming, and we look forward to seeing you there. Thank you, and all the best to you. <laughs>